The enemy of love is never outside. It's not a man or a woman. It's what we lack in ourselves. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk to blossom. Anais Nin. Your next story is told by someone who has embodied the essence of both a man and a woman, not just spiritually, but also physically. However life-altering and heavy this has been, Seven has much more to offer the world than their seemingly fluid gender. Seven is beyond an intersex story. Seven is an executive producer, writer, stand-up comedian based in Los Angeles. Seven was born in the UK with, as he says, a lady vagina and raised as a girl and discovered they were intersex, formerly hermaphrodite, at the age of 24. Today, Seven will tell us about their journey through all that came with the intersex realization, including drug addiction through to becoming an addiction counselor, evolving to an activist on a mission to help Hollywood tell intersex, non-binary, and trans stories to uplift and support BIPOC and female creatives achieve power and influence in Hollywood. The journey Seven has been on since a young child has most certainly shaped the course of their life. However, today I hope we learn on a deeper level who Seven is as, as a metahuman of sorts. A story that I believe is only just getting started. I hope you listen to Seven's story with openness, openness, compassion, and hope. While Seven's story will likely be vastly different to what you have experienced personally, the pure desire to live their most authentic life is something to celebrate and admire. The well of strength and personal resolve that Seven will have had to dig into is an inspiration that will surely inspire all of us. Welcome, Seven, to the Shot Caller podcast. Well, um, thank you. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm going to have you. <laughs> apart, apart from the fact it's eight o'clock in the morning here in Los Angeles, I'm already, I'm already welling up. And I I'm know. Even, oh, Believe my goodness. That was such, such an introduction. Thank you so much. That You're very beautiful. welcome. Well, there's nothing wrong with crying on this podcast. So I'm, I'm already also kind of, and I've read through this a couple of times. So I'm still kind of, it's very emotional. And I had to, I think I had to prepare myself for hearing your story. Because um, I know it can't be an easy one. And, and I look forward to hearing it for many different reasons. But I know that um, it's probably not going to be an easy. Parts of it won't be, won't be easy. Um, before we get into, because I think the story um, is one that starts maybe more harrowing, but then gets lighter as we go along. I was curious, what kind of child were you? Were you a curious child? Were you shy? Were you rambunctious, precocious? What kind of a child were you? <laughs> I was a nightmare child. You were a nightmare child. I, I, yes, <laughs> I was a nightmare child. Well, I, I always knew my, my own mind from a very early age. I, had, okay. I, I always had very strong opinions. Uh, I'll give you an example. I got kicked out of the brownies when I was eight years old for refusing <laughs> to swear allegiance to the queen. Oh my um, gosh. I know. Close your ears, Queen Elizabeth. Close your ears. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I actually, part of my journey in recovery is I've come to completely rethink that. that and now I'm actually a huge fan of, uh, of the British Queen. I think she's an incredible human being. Yeah. But yes, as an eight year old, I decided that, you know, I had this kind of inbuilt sense of what's fair. Mm. And, uh, and I, for some, you know, I decided that royalty wasn't a fair system as an eight year old and that I, didn't want to be compelled to you know swear allegiance to somebody that I wasn't sure that I believed in so well, yeah, that was the that was the kind of child I was <laughs> fair enough but no I was I was I mean I was always very interested in the natural world um, for me nature um, animals birds plants ah, you know, okay. the natural world is where I'm most at home I always took a very um, you know close interest in the natural world and felt at home in nature um, did you and feel particularly would, empathetic as, as a young child? Like, did you take on a lot of um, yes. what was around yes, you, I, I guess? Absolutely, yes. I, from a young age, I was very interested in animal rights. Oh. Uh, from a young age, I was very interested in, in racism. I, I, you know, I can remember kind of learning about racism as a child and it just not making sense to me. Um, and I think this probably came from my father. My father, my father was a very independent thinking person. He was mm. a policeman and oh. um, he... And he actually got asked to leave the police because he, ref he refused to join um, the Freemasons. 
Uh, right. He didn't want to join wow. the Freemasons because he felt that was that was uh, uh, you know not a, not a, a, a fair thing. Yeah, um, I suppose because women weren't allowed to join it or whatever. Wow. Uh, so it probably it probably comes from him. Um, yeah. Um, what were some of the conflicts that you had as a young person that you only understood once you had the awareness of being intersex later on? I think my story is interesting at this particular, particularly historical moment when, you know, we're having a lot of discussion in Britain and I know in other countries around trans and trans rights yeah. um, and around gender and, you know, how um, sex and gender relate to each other. You know, from the earliest age, I had issues with being a girl. You know, I, um, I, when I, before I knew I was intersex, I felt that I was kind of a natural born feminist in the sense that I didn't, I didn't think it was fair that there were things that I couldn't do as a girl. I could see the prejudice against girls and against women and kind of felt that was enormously unfair. My father, you know, I love yeah. him dearly. He passed in 2001, but he was very much the patriarch. You know, mm -hmm. he used to actually yeah. say, I am the head of the family, which ah, I okay. say goes. Yeah. He was very old school in that sense. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I just didn't get that. I didn't understand why my opinion or why a woman's opinion wasn't as valid as a man's. Mm -hmm. uh, and your mom, uh, was she, what kind of a role did she play in all of that? My mum is a very feisty lady. Um, <laughs> um, she stood up to him or that, or she, did she support you on she, that, oh, in yes, that belief? She, she did. And it was war through my childhood. They had both had very strong personalities and, you know, there was a lot of uh, conflict in my family growing yeah. up, which I think is part of why I'm such a good addiction therapist um, because I'm not scared by conflict and mm. I'm not scared by powerful individuals fighting for what they what they think they want you yeah know, in fact I'm, I'm very at home in a war zone yeah well that I mean that's you know you have to find your find your skill and then I think when you can match that up with passion you can be incredible valuable incredibly valuable to people out there so that's that that seems like a smart thing to do and I guess you can also go into um investigative reporting in 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 war zones if you if you if you ever uh, need a new career path <laughs> you're ready for that <laughs> I had a spell as a BBC journalist. I started my media career as an investigative reporter. Oh, so. that's, I didn't know it was an investigative. I have down yeah. here later to come to the BBC, but I didn't know it was that type of reporter. Oh, interesting. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My, my first ever radio feature that I did when I was at Goldsmiths College was an investigative reporting to HIV transmission through sex toys. This was in the oh. early 90s. Nobody at that point, even though AIDS had been around a while, nobody had thought about the potential risk of HIV transmission through sex toys. And wow. I managed to prove that there was a risk of transmission. And uh, yeah, Fantastic. And oh, I won the Guardian and US Student Broadcaster Award for that report. And I, 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 at the award ceremony, I, I went to the award ceremony wearing this beautiful mint green matching suit. Well, it matched with the vibrator that I had. I had this mint green vibrator and a mint <laughs> green matching suit because I was very aware of, you know, creating the perfect picture. Oh, and I got God. a picture with the guard. I got a picture with the Guardian editor, P Peter Preston. Yeah. But it never saw the light of day. Yeah. You wonder no why. We published it. Maybe we have to find a picture and put it up on the on, <laughs> on the website as well. <laughs> um, coming on to the sort of the the intersex topic, um, which is mm -hmm. a huge huge um, part of your life. I was surprised when I was doing some research on articles or interviews that you'd done before that it is as common as being a redhead. Um, and yes. one in 2000 births. Um, that was quite a surprise to me. When did you learn that? When did you find out that that was the case? It's actually even lower than one in 2000. It's one in 1500 oh, if, you, okay. if you factor in some of the other conditions. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know anything about intersex at all, like most people. I'd heard yeah. the word hermaphrodite. Yeah. But again, I would say I had a very clear idea of what what an hermaphrodite is. Um, but I found out I'm intersex when I was 24 years old, having been lied to since I was a child uh, about my medical um, condition. Um, and at that point, I was given, you know, again, very little information except to say, Oh uh, yes, when we the co the cancerous ovaries that we removed from you when you you were eight, they weren't actually ovaries; they were testes. Uh, your intersex, um, 
And uh, did that conversation come about? I mean, this is this is absolutely. Uh, I mean, was there? I don't know. I feel su such an injustice on your behalf. Um, Thank you. It was an injustice, but it's, and uh, that was in 1977 that I was operated on and told that that story that I had cancerous ovaries and that in itself was a very damaging story and a very common story that they tell uh, intersex children. Um, this is just... Wrong. But the thing about the thing about it, and the reason that motiv the thing that motivates me and my kind of mission in life is to end surgeries on intersex babies and children, because yeah. these surgeries are not actually about medicine. They're not actually about uh, you know creating safety for an intersex child. In most cases, they're usually cosmetic, to and they're usually about shoring up this idea that humans are just diamorphic, that we just come in male and female and saying that anybody who isn't born in the male or female box is a disorder of sexual development. Well, we're not disorders, we're perfectly natural and um, intersex occurs uh, in the natural world in many forms. Yeah. Uh, and actually many intersex people come with special gifts mm. um, and uh, science, science is eradicating us, well, has been erasing us in terms of our bodies, but is also now making it possible to abort intersex fetuses before they've bothered to do the research into why we have some of the strange and wonderful things that we have. I'll give you an example. Um, my particular intersex condition, which is called androgen insensitivity syndrome, uh, my people age more slowly mm. than other uh, human bodies. Uh, and you can imagine how much money exists in unlocking why that is. Yes. <laughs> um, and we, we also tend to be above average if not incredibly intelligent i'm fairly bright these days but i lost 10 iq points in my addiction um you know wow. there are, are intersex people i know who are you know incredibly intelligent and again it would be you would think worthwhile investigating what it is about our particular genetic makeup that creates that before they uh, abort us all that's horrible. I mean, it's fascinating what you say about what they've learned so far from a scientific perspective. That's fascinating. I would love to hear and learn more about that. But um, I just can't believe it's legal to do this. I mean, there's even conversations now, which I'm waiting into, to, you know, probably going to piss a lot of people off um, religiously, <laughs> but you're okay with that, right? I know you, <laughs> but about circumcising boys. Uh, There's a oh, controversy about whether that, whether whose body is it, right? Who has the right to do something like that to a, a boy's body? Um, and I have to say, as a mom, I really, I kind of agree that 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 we shouldn't. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm probably gonna get a bunch of hate mail, but I, I, I just it, instinctively that seems like a decision, a decision for the person to make. Um, so, is it legal yes. to I do mean, this? So to, so, not circumcision it, it, but it, yes it's it, it, it i mean it depends on the country that you go to but yes when you label a baby or a child a disorder then that obviously gives doctors an enormous amount of power you know we're seen as defective we're seen as not fully formed you know not coming out of the mold correctly you know everybody wants a boy or a girl you know yeah. we have gender so-called gender reveal parties it's the first question yeah. that any parent yeah. gets asked what's yeah. your child a boy or a girl so we're non-people, we're seen as non-people, we're seen mm. as defective disorders. So that means that doctors have the power, you know, if they diagnose an intersex baby in the wind to say to the parent, oh, this one's not quite right, you know, do you want to keep it? Oh, that's horrible. I mean, that it's just, I mean, horrible doesn't even cut it. Um, I, is that the case in the UK? Can it, is that still okay to do this? Yeah. Is it really? Oh God, I mean, I just... I mean, it, it's why you're, I, I guess it's why your story needs to be told because so many of us will go through this, our life with being completely ignorant, uh, best case on the, this topic. Worst case is people go out of their way to really cause damage to whether, you know, it's intersex or trans or gay or lesbian or any of these um <sighs> ways of i didn't even know how to say it um in a way that is respectful but in it when 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 one person is living their authentic self and i actually i wondered if you have insight into why this is so threatening to people 
Yes. Because I Indeed. can't understand yes. why. <laughs> I don't I don't have a problem with how the other person's living as long as they're not causing harm, you know? And I don't personally mm. I'm not personally offended if someone is is gay or trans or um I don't know what. I mean I I, I it from I, I really don't get it. And um I have a, a good friend and, and then I'll I'll pass that question on to you, but I have a good friend who's actually, she's Polish and she's Catholic. And it's, it's a couple months ago, something about a gay topic came up with a bunch of girlfriends. And Dagmara said, said quite interestingly, she said, why do we even talk about someone being gay in in, in the conversation, why is it relevant? She said, nobody, nobody introduces me as Dagmara. She likes to have sex upside down. I mean, like she was making a joke about it, you know, but she was right. Nobody introduces their heterosexual friends and says, this one's, you know, is misogynistic and likes to be spanked. And that one, you know, that one is, you know, frigid. And I mean, we don't say that. Why do we have to, why is this a thing? Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that's, that's the, the answer to that is, is kind of on many levels, isn't it? I mean, I think that religion has a big part in the situation yeah. with intersex people, certainly, you know, because many of us have been raised with um, what I call the Adam and Eve fairy story, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very misogynist story, of course, um, because the original, woman, the original human was a woman, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, anyway, let's not get down that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. path. But <laughs> it's, it's podcast two on religion, right? Yes, Although I do have later on a question religion. on that. But, but it's important, though, because those archetypal stories do really impact us and shape our view of the world. And so if you're told that the original humans were Adam and Eve, you know, and if that you've never, ever heard a story that involves somebody who doesn't fit into the pink and blue box, then we're, as I said earlier, we're non-people. And that's why I'm in Hollywood um, getting intersex stories told and being visibly in, an out in, intersex person here. Because um, although we're as common as red hair and green eyes, we have been totally erased literally, mm -hmm. medically, physically, and then culturally around the world, we have absolutely no presence in, in popular culture. Uh, I work with River Gallo, an incredible Latinx mm. uh, writer, actor, director. I know we'll come on to Pony Boy and, and that yeah. work. But River is literally going to be the world's first intersex star. Oh there isn't gosh. one up to this point. There's one model called Hannah Gabby, who's an amazing Belgian model who came okay. out as intersex. But she's about as famous as we have as an out person. Okay. Well, I can't. We are definitely going to come on to that. Um later and I, I did watch the short and I, I mean, I was just floored. Um, I, I just, I guess I wanted to spend a little bit of time on how you coped as a, as an individual, as a human, when you learned about the intersex, if, if, if that in some ways brought you clarity. Um, but I think given that I know that there's an addiction story here that, that, um, that played a role. So I wanted to, I, I guess I wanted you to be able to, to tell the audience how, how that all came together because that's part of, I mean, that's part of your growth story is, is the coming out of it, but how, you know, what, 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 um, what caused the addiction to, uh, caused you to go down that road, I guess. I'm, I'm going to rewind a little bit. I'm very sorry to your audience because you're getting me first thing in the morning in Los Angeles and I've only had half a cup of coffee and <laughs> usually I meditate and I go for a little run or I yeah. go skateboarding to the coffee shop or I do whatever I, I know. do. I know. Uh, so my brain is a little bit all over the place. So I'm going to rewind in order to answer your question. Yeah. So uh, when I was talking about kind of my early feminism, that what that was related to was that from an early age, I questioned my gender identity of girl. You know, people called me a tomboy when I was growing up and I really didn't feel like other girls I had this very kind of innate sense that there was something very different about me and that my gender was wrong and that expressed itself in terms of being that nightmare child of like refusing to put on the party dress to go to the party and hating having long hair and my yeah. mother putting my hair in pigtails and all of that stuff yeah. wanting to wear boy clothes yeah you know and that that happened from the earliest earliest kind of age and I just think that's interesting in the light of the discussions we're having around trans, because as it turned out, it was discovered about me that I have XY chromosomes rather than XX, 
and I had internal testes. And, um, you know, so it was no wonder that my, my gender did not strictly fit that female box. And I have great empathy for trans people. I think that we're in the early, very early stages of neuroscience. And there's so much about the human body biologically that we don't understand and the brain, you know, we're in, we're in our infancy of understanding the brain. So I think at some point in human history, we will discover very good reasons why trans people are trans. Yeah. And that they're absolutely right that they feel like they're in the wrong body um, but because we have this belief that there's just male and female and if you're born with a penis then you're a man and if you're born with a vagina then you're a woman that leads to a lot of people not having empathy for trans people and you know I was born with a vagina I was born with a clitoris but I'm certainly not a woman I'm an insect yeah. person yeah I I mean I honestly I it is um, I'm glad that it's coming more and more to the forefront but I've heard so many stories um, maybe anecdotally um, I mean, I don't know whether this is a good or bad reference in the community, but um, I think I watched in fascination uh, Bruce Jenner go to Caitlyn, and I think for a lot of people that was um, a moment of of really uh, going, just really, oh, you know, like uh, kind of somebody you kind of knew in a different role, and um, I watched the. Um, Oh, I didn't know he had a, he, she had a um, television show kind of behind the scenes and everything. And I, I did actually watch with some fascination, the stories of the um, other transgender people that he, inter she interviewed, sorry. Um, uh, and, and all the abuse that these people usually suffered, um, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and the high level of suicide as well in this community. Yeah. And I just, I Very just, high self-harming addiction, suicide. 50% yeah. um, of trans teens try and kill themselves. So <sighs> this is why this discussion around JK uh, and, and the debate that we're having is such an important one because at the moment, mm -hmm. trans people's mental health is awful because they have such a challenging time. And, and does it really take such a leap of faith? Does it really take so much to open your heart just a little mm -hmm. bit and accept that somebody else may know who they are better than, yeah. you know, yeah. We can judge by looking at their physical constitution. You know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person, as I'm sure many of your audience are, and I, I very much believe that the heart is the most important human mm. organ. Yeah. You know, I believe that I'm a spirit in having a physical experience. And, um, you know, I think that it's amazing how intelligent people get so obsessed with people, other people's genitals. I know. I mean, honestly, and I don't want to... I don't want to make it into a small thing because it's not a small thing. It is a, a huge source of pain and suffering for a lot of people. But honestly, when you break it down like that, it, you said it perfectly. When you, you know your own self better than somebody else ever of will. Course. So of why, course. what's wrong with, if you decide how you want to live, why does it offend your neighbor or the baker or the person at Starbucks giving your coffee why does it matter I mean I maybe I'm naive I don't know I I um but there we are it does matter to people so um and I guess um that was a hard I, I mean you tell me in your own words what happened from there how did the the story go um as you tried to cope with this learning this and trying to find yourself the disclosure um, moment didn't go at all well for me because um, apart from anything else the doctor was a classic English male older doctor completely oh. insensitive and he actually said to me I, I, I made him sound better than he was actually he, his actual words were those ovaries they weren't ovaries they were gonads now gonads is an incredibly unattractive word that you yeah. don't, don't even hear in polite society so you know that kind of went off like a kind of explosion in my mind but I think the combination of the lies for all the years, realizing that I didn't have cancerous ovaries, uh, realizing that actually my gender would have made far more sense to me as an eight year old if they'd have said, this is, you know, this is the truth of what's going on here. You're actually a mixture of male and female. You're very rare. You're very special. That's the thing that they said all the time. You're so special. You're so rare. And that was yeah. the kind of balm to make it okay. Yeah. Well, that story would have made far more sense. And I'd have been much happier if they'd have told me the truth. So finding out that that 
that that I'd been lied to by. I mean, my first doctor was a guy called Sir John Professor Dewhurst. He was the world eminent gynaecologist based out of Chelsea, Chelsea Hospital for Women and Great Ormond Street Children's mm-hmm, Hospital. Mm-hmm. That's where I used to see him, Great Ormond Street's Children's Hospital. And uh, he wrote the book on gynaecology and obstetrics, Dewhurst, that's still the Bible in medicine today. It's edited by other people now because he's dead. But he's the man who shaped the policy so i was one of his uh, early uh, experiments and it was literally an experiment experiment. it's horrible there there was this one guy a psychologist called john john money um who had two twin boys and one of those twin boys accidentally had his penis cut off in a circumcision a botched circumcision john money had the theory he believed in nurture over nature and he wanted to prove this theory. So he said to the parents, your child is under two. If you raise your child as a girl, they will be much happier. They will accept their gender identity and they will be much happier being a girl. We can make a vagina than being a boy without a penis. So that this was in the early seventies. So, so then these two, this boy and this girl were raised together and John Money kept writing papers saying this is a successful experiment. This proves that na- nurture is far more important than nature, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And he became a cause celeb. He went around the world to all the con- medical conferences speaking about this case study. Uh, Sir John Professor Dewhurst accepted this case study and was very influenced by it. And that's why they decided to lie to parents because they felt if they didn't tell the truth to parents, the socialization process would be more effective and children would would accept the gender identity that they were being given. Now, the horrible bit about this story is that this child was deeply unhappy in reality and John Money started lying in his papers when he realized that this wasn't working because his whole reputation was built on this case study, you know, being a success story. David, as the child became when he realized that he had been a boy and his penis had been cut off, David was very depressed through his 20s and ended up killing himself. He shot himself. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that is, oh, I mean, that is such medical malpractice. I cannot Mm -hmm. believe that the, the medical community accepted that as an okay strategy. I just, Jesus, that just seems nuts. I, I, the, well, that's very, very sad. But I'm sure that many young, young people out there today who might be struggling with these sort of issues will be grateful to hear those stories, right? And that's yes. part of you well, coming the, on the podcast is to tell these stories that most of us would never have heard before. Absolutely. And the thing about that story, though, is so so um, Dewhurst basically operated on lots of children through the 70s, me being one of them. And then every time I'd go and see the doctor, which was every six months, he had his army of medical students from all around the world that he was training how to diagnose intersex conditions and how to treat them. Um, and so I was part of training all of the doctors in the world who are now the lead gynecologists around the world who are continuing to do this surgery based uh, on his training. They continue so again, to. That's, oh continue to. And that's why I feel such um, a, a passion and such a mission to help people tell intersex stories and to be an intersex visible person. I'm the world's first intersex stand-up comedian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm also an actor myself and I'm, you know, and, and supporting other intersex people to become creatives and tell stories because until popular culture changes, until every parent in the world knows that some people are born intersex. So if they're pregnant with an intersex baby, that's okay. The child yeah. can be a healthy, happy person if you support and love them for who they are until you know, parents have the power of knowledge, these doctors will continue saying, oh, look, don't worry, there's a problem here, but we can fix it. Let's get this baby into surgery as quickly as possible. And we will cut off their clitoris if it's too big. Oh, my God. Which is exactly what happens. Most intersex babies emerge from the operating theater girls because, as they say, and this is the the phrase they use, it's easier to make a hole than a pole. I mean, honest to God, I cannot believe that's still happening. That just seems like something you'd hear about a hundred years ago. I mean, it just is shocking to me that that's still happening and that people, I mean, if you're a medical doctor, you understand, I mean, just also what I read about you, an article that an interview, it's the hormones. I mean, mm-hmm. we, the body is a complex organ, organ, organism. And I mean, you, you remove something and it's, it caused you issues, right? With, you now have to have well, that, yes, I mean, hormone replacements, right? 
they're, they're removing healthy parts of the endocrine system. So the result for me and my, my condition was um, they put me on estrogen when I was 12 years old. Um, and that was partly to make me develop breasts and make me look completely female. But it was also because naturally, if they'd left my testes in, I'd have been an ectomorph. I'd, I'd have been as tall as my father, probably. Uh, so I'd have been a tall, thin ectomorph with great skin. So um, I could have been a model. <laughs> and why I say that is look, there are lots of models who are AIS women because yeah. we have naturally the the body frame that's the desirable body frame for being a catwalk model <laughs> but so instead they, they take out the testes and they put you on estrogen to so i'm actually five foot seven i've grown a little bit on testosterone i've grown an inch on testosterone <gasps> since i've been on it for the last two years okay but what they didn't know was they didn't know what the long-term risks of putting a child on estrogen were going to be right. and so in my 40s my body started rejecting estrogen i got quite um fat i got really out of condition even though I was eating healthy and exercising yeah. but really depressed and that had a very biological component to my depression um, and I, my body started packing up literally my ankles started breaking down I thought I was going to end up in a wheelchair oh um, and um, it took me six months to go to the doctor because I'm still I still had medical fear medical trauma yeah. I eventually went to the doctor in Los Angeles at the LGBT center here oh, and okay. they, they, they ran my blood test and discovered my body was a injecting the estrogen it was basically washing the estrogen straight out of my system so i had no hormones at all pretty much oh, um, and at that point they said look why don't you try testosterone because your body would have produced testosterone yeah. within hours of the first shot of testosterone i suddenly felt like i was on the right fuel for the first time in my life oh, and God. within a matter of months my body completely healed itself and i'm now 51 years old and i'm in the best health i've ever been you know, well I judging by that marks and sparks picture on instagram <laughs> i was very envious of both your your <laughs> And your, <laughs> and your sports bra. <laughs> yes, the sports bra is good. Well, I'm, I know, and, and if you look at my, if you look at my Instagram, which is Angels Are Intersex, you're going to think, oh my goodness, this person's a bit thirsty for likes. And I am a bit thirsty for likes. But it's, who is it? It's who is also, it? who is it? But it, it's also there because I am showing that, you know, I am getting in the best shape of my life. I feel really healthy. I look really healthy. And that's because I'm on the right hormone. So again, yeah. it's showing that, by deciding that AIS yeah. children are girls and deciding yeah. their gender for them yeah. and forcing us to take the wrong hormones, they're actually harming us. You know, they're God, really yeah. harming us. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not anywhere close to being a doctor, but I, I, I feel like that's just obvious. I mean, I, oh God, I mean, this, this is crazy. We, I will join you in whatever I can do to, to stop that because that is just all kinds of wrong. Um, okay. Um, you mentioned shame in one of your articles in dealing with shame. Yes. How have you, what's your journey been there? What does that look like? Um, I know one of the, the big proponents of dealing with shame, and I suspect may play a role in people who judge others that are not in the, the blue or the pink box, is that they're coming out of their own uh, something shameful, not, not necessarily the same topic, but some, somewhere they, they, they are angry and they need to project um, onto other people. Um, but Brene Brown, for instance, is that somebody you've, you've, oh, you've wonderful. read and her. kind of has... Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got her audio, audio books yeah. on, uh, on Audible and uh, yeah, she, if ever I'm feeling like I just need to get back in, connected and back into love and back yeah. into positivity, I put on yeah. Brene Brown. She's okay. literally a goddess. Yeah, no, she's fantastic. But how did you, how, I mean, how, what was your addiction kind of, uh, what, 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 what helped you turn it around? What was the point where you, you were like, okay, this is, I, I've got to change something here? Mm. Well, again, I think my story is an interesting one in terms of addiction, uh, and it certainly helped me as an addiction expert and therapist, um, because I get to really see how different things came together to create my addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely, I, I know that the trauma around my diagnosis, how I was treated, the operation, you know, this is one thing about any genital surgery on a child genital surgery is akin to rape trauma on a child so yeah, sure. it's effectively like being raped by your doctor yeah. um and and then being examined every six months by yeah. a whole group of strangers yeah. you know, again that's kind of that sexual trauma yes um you know and a lot of intersex children end up getting sexually abused 
um, when they go back home to their communities because we have no ba- we have no boundaries physically because we're used to adults looking at us. We don't think we've got a right to say no to things. So mm. many intersex children have a long history of childhood sexual abuse because the fathers can spot a vulnerable child a mile away. Um, so, so all of that happened and that definitely fueled my addiction. However, I also come from a half Scottish family and there was addiction on both sides of my family tree and addiction is a family illness. Yeah. So, and, and I know that when I took my first drink as a 12 year old, I responded to it in a very powerful way. It was a very positive, very powerful. I want more yeah. of that kind yeah. of experience. Yeah. The same with cocaine and so same with many other substances. You know, for me, they were transformative. I loved how they took me from this anxious kind of person who didn't feel like they fitted in um, to the person that I felt that I am, which is a gregarious, confident, you know, so, so they really changed me. Um, and from the word go with certain things, um, I wanted more of them. You know, like I may have, when I was a child, I got drunk a few times, um, you know, to the point of feeling sick while being sick. But, you know, that might put one child off. But for me, as a would-be alcoholic, I just wanted to go back, but go back to the flame and have more, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I can really see how the different things connect to create somebody who's got, uh, you know, an addiction. Um, but the good thing about that is I also, um, ha- because of my experience with addiction, and I literally tick at pretty much every box that mm. you can for addiction, which is substances, gambling, okay. um, computer, computer games, okay. uh, shopping, yeah. food, all of them. Yeah, because I went through them all to try and fix myself. Uh, It means that um, I really understand the addiction tree, as we call it. And so when I work with people, the model that I developed for treating addiction is a very holistic model. I I look at all of the different symptoms, but then I look at the underlying roots of the addiction, which are trauma trauma usually yeah um and I've, I've been very privileged to have i spent nine months in rehab in 2001 into 2002 for my substances okay and then um i've had the experience of working with some of the best therapists in the world okay um, continually since 2001 and then when i was nearly 10 years sober i went back into rehab for three months in florida um, and I did three months of trauma specific rehab um, to, to deal with the childhood uh, issues. Okay. Okay. So all of that work, which very few people have the opportunity or, or the resources to be able to go and do that work. Yeah. All of that work informs my work now as an addiction coach, as I call myself in Los Angeles. On the topic of resources, because that's another issue that I remember hearing about um, with regards to specifically trans people, um, first mm-hmm. of all, to, let's say, um, have surgery that allows them to live the way they, they, they feel that they should live. That's obviously very expensive. But then there's also, I yeah. think, to, for lack of a better word, maintenance, right, that has to come with that. Um, but then also the shocking statistics around getting employed um, yes. seems to also be um, really, really difficult. Um, how how have finances impacted that that your kind of um journey because it sounds like you recognize that maybe you had some means that other people didn't is that because of your family or because of your work or <laughs> not, not because of my family no not because I, of your family. I, no i was lucky at the point that i needed to go to rehab in 2001 that i'd been a successful location director for the bbc and okay. um and other television companies um throughout the all of the 90s i was the youngest um youngest uh, location director in the bbc and i i built a successful career as a location director you know doing stuff like um i, I directed a shoot in uh, the nile valley with eight cameras including two military helicopters oh, and, wow. you know i got to do they were kind of really fun the really fun, fun kind of location directing stuff yeah. yeah so at the point i didn't have i because i spent a lot of money on drink and drugs i didn't have loads of money in the bank when i went into rehab but i did have good credit with barclays who okay. very kindly fronted me my, re- my rehab money okay um oh. Go Barclays. Yeah. So it's not, it's not that I go <laughs> yeah. Barclays. I know. Yeah. Let's give them At least on that topic, um, go Barclays. <laughs> on that topic, yeah. Um, so it's not that I, I, I come from money, but um, compared to a lot of people, though, you know, I, I had access to resources. And I also am lucky that I could see that I needed to prioritize recovery. Okay. Um, you know, I need, I could see, I didn't have children and I wasn't married and stuff at that point. So I could see that I really needed to take time out from my career when they said to me, you know, you need to not go back to television for a year and you need right. to do something really normal right. for a year to rebuild your health and to also deflate your ego. Cause my ego was 
of being inflated by being a location director and cocaine and all of that enabled lifestyle that I had so when I left rehab I be, I, <laughs> this is typical me uh, I go to the kind of nth degree so I became I became a postal delivery person getting up at four o'clock in the morning going to the sorting office sorting the letters for three or four hours and then going out on a bike around Surrey uh, delivering three 15 kilogram bags of mail every day and I did it for 365 days exactly uh, earning per week what I earned per day as a television director oh my um, goodness and it was it was incredibly challenging in every way possible, but it did exactly what my therapist wanted, which was it deflated my ego, it reconnected me with humanity, it taught me the value of money again, because prior to recovery, mm. my unit of currency was 70 pounds, because that's how much a gram of cocaine cost, okay. and if something was under 70 pounds, then it had no value, wow. so you know, earning 213 pounds per week for that level of uh, you know physical and emotional investment you know, put me back into humanity and gave me a kind of appreciation of things again. Um, and it also meant that I showed myself that I was very serious about being sober, yeah. you know, to have put that level of effort in uh, has meant that no matter how challenging my life has got in recovery, I'm not willing to go through that experience again. So, you know, uh, I'm now 18, coming up for 19 years sober mm. and uh, everything I have in my life today, I really, really value in yeah. what I do to Hollywood beyond my wildest dreams yeah and certainly because when, when I was a postal worker my my memory was so shot from my drink and drugs yeah. you know that it was like groundhog day every day and physically I thought maybe this is it maybe yeah. the best that I can do at this point in my life is stay sober yeah. and just be a postal worker because I've you know ruined my brain yeah. so you know one day at a time I've rebuilt my health and rebuilt my career and now at 51, I finally feel like I'm kind of on the verge of achieving the things that I have the potential to achieve. Wow, that's fantastic. And it's such a, a nice juncture because your story is, is, like I said, it's, it's, I think you're just on the beginning, just from what I've read and our, our communication so far. Um, but that's a great, mm. that's a great realization and that's real power. And, um, it sounds like it's just exactly what you needed. And, uh, you know, that's fantastic that you prioritized yourself in, in all of that mess and of addiction and yeah, I guess, um, transition. So speaking of transitions, when did you mm -hmm. say goodbye to Sarah and hello to uh, seven? Hello to seven. Um, again, I didn't really, I didn't plan to do that. What happened was um, I got sick when I moved to Los Angeles in December 2015. Um, I, well, I, I started to get sick. I didn't know what was going on physically, but um, I became a creative person. I decided I needed a complete break from addiction therapy. I'd been doing it for 10 years. I'd been an advisor to the British government for six years, sitting on the advisory yeah. council on the misuse of drugs. Yeah. You know, my life had revolved around re recovery and addiction completely. So when I got here, I decided to let myself have some time off and to become a creative person again. Um, but just really for my own personal kind of uh, edification and fun, really. Um, and... So I started doing some stand-up comedy, going out at night, doing open mics. Um, and I wrote a really awful play. Well, the play was good, but I was awful in it, which was called Sarah, Sarah G's Spot, the number one ballsy woman, which I performed at the Hollywood Fringe. That's the first intersex play that's ever been performed at the Hollywood Fringe. Okay. Um, what was good about it, it was, it was terrible in many ways, but it did, the, the, the closing monologue was me talking about what happened with the doctors. And on stage in the last performance was the first time I ever really connected with the true feelings about that. And I just sobbed on stage. Uh -huh. So it was awful for, it, awful for the audience. <laughs> and my director came up to me afterwards and said, do you want to take you to see the Sinai? <laughs> and she was that worried about me. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But it was cathartic. I, I was fine. It was just, I, it was cathartic. And I was having an emotional breakthrough that I'd never managed to have before. So being on stage showed yeah. me the power of being a performer and the power of creativity and healing. Wow. Um, I went away from that experience. And then the next thing I wrote, which was called Angels Are Intersex, yeah. I performed at the Son of Semley Play, uh, sorry, Son, Son of Semley Festival in Los Angeles. And that uh, I'm really pleased with as a play. Uh, it, it was a great thing for me to write because it took me on a journey. I went to speak to, um, uh, I went to speak to the different major faiths. I met Rabbi Michelle at Temple Israel, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who 
It was wonderful. And she told me that in Judaism, they have at least five recognized genders and two of those genders are definitely intersex genders. So we were very much accepted and known about in Judaism. I went to speak to a Muslim scholar and he said that before uh, Islam becoming really patriarchal, um, in it, that, that we actually used to sit between the men and the women, you know, that you have the men's area and the women's area. Well, before patriarchy, intersex people sat in the middle as like the literal bridge between humanity. So again, we were acknowledged. I went to speak to a, a Christian um, vicar in England who spoke beautifully about how angels are intersex and about the spirit. Um, anyway, I, I, I took little extracts from all of these wonderful people that I met and I wrote this play, Angels Are Intersex, which I performed uh, in LA. And then um, in the closing monologue of that, I wasn't losing my shit, thank goodness. <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead, I said to the audience that the experience of writing and performing this play had really helped me understand things in a new way. And I realized that Sarah was just part of me uh, and I needed to change my name and could the audience help me with ideas? And I also said, I also started to recognize that I needed to, to change my pronouns and change my gender identity. Um, so again, in, in terms of the work I do now as a creativity coach, I got to really experience on stage and in the writing process, how creativity can really move us forward uh, as humans and help us connect with our authentic true selves. Wow. Um, so in the months after performing that play, which I performed in uh, 2017, um, I uh, became a they, there, them person instead of a she, her. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't like that process. You know, I'm very into the English language and I didn't like they, them particularly, but I didn't like the other options, non-binary right. options even more. So I went with the they, them. And actually, you know, n now that I use that, it does really speak to my multiplicity. Mm -hmm. it, it does work for me emotionally. Um, and seven, um, I went through lots of permutations of a name beginning with S that's non-binary. I went through the scouts and, you know, the, the, uh, um, what else did I consider? Um, Shea and oh, just lots of different S, yeah. S names and Sage. I was into Sage oh. for a while. I sat, I sat with Sage for a week, but I said to my chiropractor, I was thinking about Sage and he said to me, don't do it. Every single child under two in Santa Monica is being called Sage. Avoid it like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I did. But That's then hilarious. I was in the back of, I was, a, yeah, yeah, I was in the back of an Uber and seven came to me and I, oh. you know, sometimes things just drift. I was like, my reaction to seven was like, that's ridiculous. I can't be seven. That's a number. Don't be stupid. And then I thought, well, okay, I just heard it. So let's <laughs> have it. I got on the internet and Googled seven. And then of course I came up with all of the incredible symbolism and, and, and the, the many ways that seven is a powerful number, seven colors of the rainbow, seven deadly scenes, you know, seven is a, one of those numbers that's really important to humanity and, and, you know, a powerful, powerful number. And uh, then also being a stand-up comedian, one of the things I came across was a scene from Seinfeld where um, <laughs> one of the main characters in Seinfeld wants to call his unborn ch born child seven and his fiance won't ah. let him. It's the, it's the number of his favorite baseball player. Is that George? Then, was it George? George yes, yeah, it was George. I remember that. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And then Jerry goes around the apartment saying, well, why don't you call him ketchup or why don't you call him, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I, of course, being a stand up, I loved the connection with, with uh, Seinfeld and, and that. So, so it all came together and I Brilliant. thought okay, I'll, try, I'll try it out. And people immediately had a really positive response to it. Um, I realized that it's got the same number of vowels as Sarah. Uh, on, I put it on Facebook in the middle of the night, just to have a look to see yeah. how it looked. Yeah, and it kind of echoes Sarah. It honors Sarah, but it it embraces. I, I and then as I did more journaling and kind of more inner child work, I realized that the little male child in me. You know, some people have an inner child. I have inner children. So the inner the inner child who's female is Sarah, but yeah. the inner boy child in me is Stephen. So Sarah and Stephen came together to um, come seven. Oh, I mean, I love it. I thought I think I think it's fantastic, and I'm also partial to to the number seven. I my birthday in America. American date style mm -hmm. is 7171. And so oh, okay. I'm just a real, I love seven. So for me, I was like, that's a super cool name. I really like that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thrilled with that. I'm writing uh, your birthday down. That's a, that oh. a special number. 
<laughs> it's not a hint. <laughs> um, although I will be 50 next year. So it, the next year will be a big great. one. <laughs> um, 50 is a great, num great age and a great number. Don't anybody ever be down on being 50. I think I've had the best time as a 50 and a 51 year old. I love it. I think I it's, I think powerful. it's, it's a moment for a Renaissance. You know, I really mm. actually think it's a great time to reflect. And if Definitely. you really go inwards, not into the, the ego, right. Which is the source mm -hmm. of, I think all of our bullshit. Um, mm. You can really, I think, I mean, I'm on the journey, the inner, you know, also uh, the, the mindfulness, the, the power of now I'm listening to that on, on oh, um, audio book. I finished the untethered soul recently. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. been my COVID experience. I've actually flourished in COVID as a human, not mm -hmm. in other ways, but um, so that's, we can, we can, we can talk about that further as well. Um, but I think that absolutely 50, you can just make so much happen. And I think you can also, you know yourself better. And so you can do some real impactful work Definitely. at that age Definitely. right and especially for for biological women as well i think it's a really important decade because finally you're leaving behind all of the kind of physical realities of menstruation <laughs> and all of that stuff and often children are getting that bit older so yeah you, yeah you, you for sure come back to, come back to self it's yeah really for early. sure i, I absolutely my experience working with women in their in i their agree 40s. It's yeah. very true. It's very true. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not looking badly on it, but I actually want to you look live. Fabulous. Can I just oh. say, I would, I thought you were in your thirties, late thirties. I would never have you. you come out for 50. You look <laughs> Thank amazing. You. Thank you very that's, much. That's it's Swiss not always, I do have a little bit of extra makeup on. Yeah. The Swiss, the Swiss, Swiss weather probably helps a little bit. Um, no, the Swiss air. The Swiss the Swiss air. air. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. The mountain air. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, I want to take a sidestep for a second because I think it's interesting and I think just insight into a world where a lot of us only saw the headlines and that was your experience and work with Amy Winehouse. Mm. Um, I mean, when from, I was in London at the time that, that, you know, she was kind of going off the rails or we were still living yes. there. And I was, I think a little harsh in my judgment of her because only things that I knew were what were, what was spread across the headlines and it just seemed like a total shit show. Um, yes. And then recently I'm trying to remember not, you know, within the last year I watched um, the documentary on her life and you saw the background and I, mm. Oh my God. I mean, I just, and it had a similar experience with, um, with um, the, the DJ who killed himself. Um, oh God, I cannot. It's my, one of my son's favorite DJs. Um, anyway, uh, it'll come to me in a second. But watching also that, his documentary before he died, that was done. Mm -hmm. The amount of enabling around mm -hmm. these people, especially by the direct family. Um, and with Amy Winehouse, her just seeing what her, she had those two, what seemed to be close friends who were actually trying to help her. They seemed mm -hmm. to be very, really real friends trying, just mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to deal with, with her life. But, oh my God, I mean, that, that just seemed like such a tragic story. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing, the thing, that documentary by Asif Kapadia is a very good documentary, but I do have some issues with it because, mm. um, I actually only got to work with Amy one night, which was at the Grammys. Yeah. Um, her very good friend, Kelly Osborne, had been trying for some years to get Amy to see me. Um, Amy, uh, Kelly and I did, uh, Kelly had a radio show in England for Radio One called The Sunday Surgery, which is a young people's ah. discussion phone-in show. And okay. I was the addiction expert on that. Yeah. So Kelly and I had worked together a few times and she'd seen me in action working with young people and saw that I obviously understand addiction inside out, but also yeah. that uh, I'm very empathetic, but also I don't take bullshit. And I right. call people, I call people on things. And I don't let people get away with right. shit, you know, excuse yeah. my language. I'm very, okay. <laughs> I think but, shit yeah, I, so, for sure. <laughs> we can say shit. Okay, we can good. Say shit. I, so, okay good. So, <laughs> um, so Kelly, Kelly really wanted Amy to come and see me and, um, and she wouldn't because 
Amy was in a situation like many people are from wealthier families where um, she was seeing the best doctors uh, in London. And um, it's great to see the best doctors if you've got cancer, but often doctors don't understand addiction, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, doctors, the whole Western medical system is based on identifying what the illness is and then prescribing something. Yeah, and yeah. Often in addiction, um, obviously, if you've got psychiatric dual diagnosis issues, then you will need to see a psychiatrist and be prescribed something to manage your depression or you know if you're bipolar or whatever but for many people who've got addictions actually it's about learning to live without taking something outside of yourself learning yeah. how to face the feelings that yeah. come up in recovery and grow through them yeah and not medicate them with something yes. so yes. amy was getting to see the best doctors and it wasn't helping she was running rings around them and she was getting more and more sick as we saw that story played out yeah. and i think that that story was heartbreaking and it also showed us exactly how the media operate which is from a place of liking the car crash and liking yeah. the, the, the the bleeding toes and the beaten up faces etc because that's all great dramatic pictures that sells newspapers sells but it's newspapers. not coming from a place of love and support yeah. i was working often with newspapers trying you know helping them being an addiction expert but the struggle you have to go through every time just to get them to put some basic information in a box out that actually will be of use to people reading that story family members reading it or addicts themselves reading it it's a struggle because they're acting really most of them are, a lot of them aren't that interested in being part of the solution they just want to wallow in the problem yeah. um Anyway, finally, uh, the night of the Grammys, Amy couldn't perform at the Grammys live in LA because she had an outstanding court case, um, you know, and she couldn't have uh, had a criminal record. So she was forced to perform live from a studio in London. Mm -hmm. And um, at this point, Ray Cosbert, her manager, came into the picture. Um, uh, Kelly was speaking to him about me. And so what we did, it was a little bit naughty, <laughs> uh, it, it, but what we did was they got me a backstage room um, yeah. at the Riverside Studios and I set up a backstage chill out area so a very non-threatening environment and I ran acupuncture drop-in I'm, I'm a trained uh, NADA detox acupuncturist in Europe wow. um, so I did acupuncture and um, the performances they were rehearsing all evening and then the performances were all through the night Amy uh, actually won five Grammys that night it was for the Black, Back to Black album which had rehab the single on it Amazing. Um, so we were up all, up all night and so through the evening different members of the band came to the out room and had acupuncture and they got to experience how it really relaxes you naturally and you know went away from the experience buzzing and went back and so finally at about 11 o'clock at night Amy and two friends came in to see me and had the treatment and we got to spend about an hour together talking and we had a real connection and, and uh, I know that I could have helped her you know of mm. course um, but unfortunately that was the only night I ever saw her um, and um, I, 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 I look back on that experience and I slightly made a mistake in that um, I got too close to Mitch that night in front of her. It would have been better if I'd avoided, therapeutic, it would have been better if I'd avoided Mitch. Yeah. Um, so that she felt that her relationship was just with me. Independent. Um, in yeah. terms of independent. Um, but anyway, it, that's the way it was. That's the way it's meant to be. Yeah. Amy went off. She did get clean of heroin and crack and other illegal drugs. But as we know, she continued drinking. Yeah. Um, Mitch and I ended up working together. He came to see me on camera on Harley Street, where my clinic was at that time. And uh, that's um, in his documentary, My Daughter Amy. And you can see in that session how he's still in huge denial around the drinking and why the drinking yeah. was a problem. And yeah. in the course of that session, I help him to understand that it doesn't matter what the substance is, that for somebody with an addic addiction like that, abstinence is the only way forward mm -hmm. because any substance, A, any substance can get out of control and many of these substances can kill us in their own right. Yeah. Of alcohol, certainly, as we saw Amy drank herself to death, but yeah. also, um, you know, even cannabis, if somebody is a, a, a heroin addict or a crack cocaine addict and they cross addict onto cannabis, you know, sooner or later, it's likely that they will go back to the thing that they originally were trying to stop because the amygdala, which is where the addiction is based, which is the old reptilian area of the brain, mm. it doesn't particularly distinguish between different substances. Right. And every, every day you're abstinent, it kind of calms down, it dies down. I say it's like a fire dying down to the embers when you yeah. when you stop using. But if you're using any mood altering substance, the emotional dysregulation process is still happening. The fire is still being fed. And sooner or later, you probably will go back to the, the, the thing that you really crave. Yeah. Um, and that, it, that, you know, 
It lowers your inhibition. I mean, I know um, exactly, yeah. when I, when I, um, I am, I know this about myself, I'm much better at abstinence than um, moderation. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not the kind of person that can um, just have one glass of wine. I mean, I don't have a bottle, but I, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I couldn't just, just if a bottle's open, I mean, I can, I mean, I, I can, but it's much harder than if I say, nope, I'm not drinking under the week. That's it. And yeah. it's much easier for me. I'm not, I'm not in any way bothered, um, but when I do have a, a glass of wine or two, then all of a sudden I'm eating the stuff that I said I wouldn't eat. And, you know, it's a slippery slope. Um, mm -hmm. It's not causing yeah. massive destruction to my of life, course. but it, it certainly it does my, yeah, it, it, self, it, it is harmful in the sense of self-esteem because then you beat yourself, you know, you get into the cycle of, I shouldn't have eaten mm -hmm. that, I shouldn't have had the third glass of wine, and so I can, on that level, totally understand why it you know, anything that you yeah. use casually, if you're already an addictive personality, is going to come back to harm you. Sure. And I think, you know, there are lots of people, especially at the moment with COVID-19, who are understanding how, you know, their drinking has become unhealthy or their yeah. eating has become unhealthy because stress and anxiety and fear drives us to fix ourselves in various ways and you know alcohol and sugar are fantastic ways to numb feelings and make us feel better uh, and many people are, are over drinking and overeating right now and and doing things that they wouldn't ordinarily do and feeling really bad about it mm. you know the thing about an addict the thing about an addict uh, though is that um it's it it, it it it's a progressive illness so yeah. uh, it gets more and more out of control um and uh you know and it takes you to do things that are against your moral code uh, yeah. you start to experience more and more what we call powerlessness which is where you know you you may s like at the moment you've got the ability to say no i'm just not going to drink till yeah. friday because one glass isn't going to do it for me yeah as an alcoholic i never understood one gl yeah. glass it's like one glass why on earth would anybody want to drink one glass oh, of know. wine that's crazy <laughs> <I> you know, know. <laughs> But, but I know I know there are these normal muggle people who enjoy one glass and good I for know. them. Right? I've, I, don't those I don't know. Do those <laughs> I don't know any of those people. I don't know those people. They're not my friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately, I could use a few of them in my life. Actually, because my my friends are way too accommodating when you need another glass of wine. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. How how are you marrying the inner? Um, serenity that you've been working on with the LA lifestyle of Ken and Barbie. <laughs> oh, Ken and Barbie. <laughs> um, LA is an interesting place. I love it. First of all, let me just say, I love LA. Yeah. But there are things about LA which I despise. Yeah. Uh, and I think sure. that's probably a lot of people's experience. Yeah. Um, my experience of LA, because I live in West Hollywood, isn't particularly Ken and Bar Barbie. It's more Ken and Ken. <laughs> <probably>. <laughs> yeah. But you, you, you still have but the Kens similar. and the Kens who are really into their physical yes. appearance, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, living in LA is, is kind of a strange place. If you're here too long, going anywhere other than LA is a real might. It really kind of messes with your mind because you get used to the fact that your barista looks like a Hollywood star. Yeah. You know, it's like ev every good looking person, yeah. or, you know, who's got any degree of acting or modeling talent has left the United States and come to Los Angeles. And most of these people are, you know, servers and baristas, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So you're, you're surrounded by, the, and, you know, spend a lot of time in the gym and, you know, doing their yoga and hiking in Runyon Canyon and yeah. drinking their green juice and everything. So <laughs> it's, it, that's, you can, you can respond to that in two ways. When I first came here, as I said, I was getting very unwell. I was putting on lots of weight. If you look at the, my videos on my YouTube channel, um, you know, uh, I, I was looking bad and I wasn't because I wasn't, I was a member of Equinox in those days. This is before I found out that Equinox um, VC funds Trump. I was, so I was a member of Equinox back in those days and okay. I was working out with a personal trainer, but I was looking terrible. Oh, yeah. um, and, and so as a person who doesn't look like one of them, one of the Kens or one of the Barbies, it's a challenging place, you know, um, but um, it's also very positive inspiring place because wherever you go you do meet people who know a lot about nutrition who understand different yoga sauna you know um everybody is going hiking every day so the kind of peer pressure is good peer pressure rather than bad peer pressure yeah on that um, side of it for sure it's kind of a barbell la because on the one hand yes. you have you can live a super clean life in la 
I oh, mean, really clean. and you can be, mm -hmm. have people that support that because, um, it's all around you, like the, the juice bars and the, um, the rollerblader. I mean, everything it's like that, but on the other side, there's this, um, sometimes soullessness to the city, um, mm. which is more in your face than other cities. I mean, every city is going to have their, their warts and things like that. But, um, I did find it's funny because I, I only go to LA very infrequently now. And we went there a couple of years ago because my cousin was getting married and actually in, in, um, in one of the canyons near Malibu. So that was kind of fun to go back. But, um, I found oh, myself, yeah. you know, in the mirror, in the car, you know, checking my makeup more regularly. And, and mm. I found myself more aware of my physical, uh, yeah, how I was looking mm, I think way more when for, I go to LA. Me, sure. With, for women, especially LA is a much harder place. Yeah. You know, I remember the first time I went to a Thanksgiving dinner here, um, there, there were two plates and it was a plate that a man would often take. And then a, what I see as a side plate that many of the women were taking a side plate. So they were just having like a, a, a dull portion of food, you know, so God, the pressure to be thin, the pressure oh to, yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's no, gross. That's terrible. Uh, yeah. So there is that pressure on women to have that small body size. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and obviously, yeah, have perfect makeup. Yeah. You know, be wearing, be wearing great clothes 24 seven. Well, you can yeah. either got to wear a great outfit or yeah. you've got to be wearing Lululemon. You know, there's oh. no Lululemon yoga clothes. There's no, there's no middle path in that. So yeah, me, be, me becoming trans masculine, growing stubble, not having yeah. to wear makeup, you know, yeah. <laughs> looking like this. I have an easy time. I have an easy time compared to, compared to women. Well, let's just talk about that, 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 you know, um, girl to, to intersex person, because you have mm. got a very unique, um, insight into both, right? I mean, yes. you've bought clothes for, for, for both situations. How I have do shopped you... in, in, shopped in both departments. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you wake up and feel anything goes for you? Like you can dress up a bit more feminine or you can, can go a bit masculine. Um, do you have, do, have you given yourself that freedom or is that not of interest to you? Mm. Are you more on the masculine oh, side of things and that's just where you are now? You know what? I think, I think it's a yin yang situation. I've gone over to, to, to the male side at the moment, but I suspect I can't, I'm definitely synthesizing both sides of myself. And I spent so many years living, you know, trying to, fit into the pink box yeah especially I don't know why but in recovery I, I started date I, I started dating and I actually married two people who really wanted me to be my female self as much as possible especially my first wife she really was and at that point I had long blonde blonde hair oh, I was wearing quite a lot of makeup I was doing quite a lot of on-camera work as an yeah. addiction expert in Europe yeah um and so I looked completely different to how I look now yeah so I really swang right yeah. over to that I never felt comfortable in dresses and skirts particularly although yeah. I did have some skirts that I enjoyed wearing um <laughs> right now I'm, I'm enjoying exploring my masculine side I'm I I was really scared when I started growing stubble age 50 because again I'm supposed to be completely immune to testosterone and that's my yeah. diagnosis yeah um, and uh, yet my my clitoris started growing uh, and you know and that was a kind of interesting process like how how big does a clitoris get before it becomes a penis you know it's like, it's like at what stage is this going to stop nobody knew I yeah. didn't know and yeah. then and then and that started first and then my face started growing hair and at first I could pluck them out one at a time and I was like desperately plucking out. But then I was in London for our film was the, at the film festival, BFI film festival in London. And I, I was in my friend Kari's house and I thought, I actually have to shave. And that was like a terrible moment for me. I was really scared. I was like, yeah. oh my God, am I going to have to tell people I'm shaving now, age 50? And nobody had taught me how to yeah. shave. I was well, in my dad's no. day, so I, I mean, what kind that. of, yeah, you weren't ready for that experience. I wasn't. That's, yeah. But I, I did it. And, and then I realized that actually, like a few weeks later, I realized that I actually really like my face with a bit of stubble. I actually feel like myself with a bit of stubble. Okay. And now, I'm, I mean, I'm, I live in West Hollywood, which is the best, safest place in mm. the world for me to be able to go on this journey and experiment. Yeah. I am aware I'm a trailblazer and I'm kind of, so it's good that I've got this opportunity in this safe space to do yeah. this. But now I'm truly embracing showing my non binaryness to the world. And I think it's important for people to understand yeah. and to visually see that some people are born non-binary yeah. so as you saw in that video i am proudly showing yeah. off the 38 double d's it is a lovely bra too 
<laughs> it was a lovely Marks and Spencer's bra. Uh, I've got it on now, actually, it, but I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> well, we can link it to your Instagram page. I we loved it. I loved it. Uh, and, thank you. Marks and Spencer's are great underwear. I really like them. But do you know um, what I thought and, about? I said, I thought, damn it. I wish I would have seen that post a couple of days earlier because my, my daughter has two of her best friends from London who she grew up with before we moved to Switzerland come over. And the mom was like, do you need anything? And I'm like, Earl Grey tea? And I, anyway, I was like trying to think, what do I need? <laughs> and then I'm like, damn it. I wish I would have known about that bra. I would have had her go get me one. <laughs> Mark anyway. Spencer's, yeah. I can order it online. Um, so, yes. Okay. Um, I, I think I think that I probably will because I, I basically and this is part this is part of my mission. Can you hear me, Shannon? I did. You broke up for a second, but you're back now. Yeah. You know, part part of my mission with um, helping um, humanity move beyond the binary boxes is because as a therapist, I work with many people, many people who identify as straight and cisgendered, you know, meaning it's a man who feels like he's a man, a woman who feels like she's a, a woman, you know, born biologically that way. So I've worked with many, you know, people who are, are, are you know, the, the, the most, the majority, shall we say, and yet many of those people in that therapeutic relationship express insecurities and fears and dissatisfactions with the limits of being in the pink or the blue box mm. you know i think all of us make sacrifices to subscribe to this system and many of us feel there are things about ourselves that we can't express fully because it's not okay as a woman to do that or yeah. to look like that or to buy that or to enjoy that so i think that intersex people can actually help humanity to question this system and move beyond it and you asked at near the beginning why i think that this is something that we take so seriously and get the so much many strong feelings about it well i'm an anthropologist by academic training and mary D douglas an amazing anthropologist wrote okay. a book called purity and danger uh, where she looks at humans a desire to create taxonomies you know to, to you know put the world into categories and you know to decide this is this and this is this and you know it helps how we think or it we kind of it, it's hardwired into us to do this of course is that it's part of our, uh, our our dinosaur brain is that part of it like i i think i think it's i think it's part of our consciousness it's our, it's how we developed intelligence to manage and you know and control our environment and keep things. ourselves safe yeah uh, i think assess things like you know is this a good thing that's safe or is this a bad thing that's going to cause danger you know mm -hmm. is it is, so it is it is hardwired into the amygdala in terms of survival so that's mm -hmm. why it's very important and she says that things that fall outside of these categories are perceived as dirty and um unclean and uh, and cause anxiety in us because we can't immediately contain them and control them and i think intersex people do that you know, and I think that um, the denial process, what, you know, I've been involved in various human rights campaigns uh, in my life. You know, I was involved in anti-apartheid when I was a teenager. I was involved wow. in anti-vivisection when I was a teenager. Wow. I was involved in environmental and anti-nuclear protesting. Um, I, I've been involved in queer, queer rights as a, uh, when I was at Goldsmiths. I was part of outrage demonstrating for queer human rights. Intersex human rights is by far the hardest agenda I've ever worked on. There's far more resistance and it's far more difficult to get people to become allies and join us and support us and help us. And I think that is because of this basic thing that all of us feel slightly shaken. All of us can feel our brains kind of slightly kind of trembling when we learn this knowledge and try and integrate this knowledge into this way that we've been raised. You know, it questions are very conception of how the universe is built um and so it's difficult you know humans like the well-worn path we don't like the untrod path um but that again is where i think this is a powerful powerful thing and that if people can break through their conditioning and join us actually our human rights struggle can liberate humanity and also we're at a particularly historical moment when there's this huge division between men and women you know patriarchy is starting to crumble but mm. men still are in charge but we also have this real power dynamic and power struggle and we are two, in these two opposing camps and i think intersex people and the lessons that we have can be that bridge as islam saw we can be the bridge to hopefully see the connection between men and women and the similarities rather than the differences. God, it's amazing. I mean, there's so much to dissect in what you just said. I mean, I think it's beautiful what you said. 
um, and I think you're spot on from what I, I mean, I'm early in this journey, but if I just take my experience preparing to interview you, I was quite nervous because I thought, well, am I going to say the wrong thing? Will I use the wrong pronoun? Will I, will I somehow, will my ignorance be, um, you know, cause me to, to say something insensitive? Um, but just our conversation has been so so totally natural and so fascinating, and I've I can already feel uh, uh, some of the weight coming off of the topic, and me feeling like okay, I I feel informed, I feel open to learning more, understanding more, and um, yeah. So I I mean I think I think that's that just in the the short time we spent together that I've I've actually physically feel less anxious because I'm learning your story and it doesn't, it's not so scary. It's, it, you know what I mean? It's actually fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. And I, um, I hope that, I hope that all of the, the strife and the, also the patriarchy, I completely agree with you. And I had this conversation with, with my husband the other day. Sometimes he'll say certain things and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I kind of, push push back on it and he's very supportive of what I do and I I guess you'd call me a feminist um but I said to him the other day I said you know feminism is not just about um freeing women from the confines of of our current um environment I said actually true feminist is 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 fighting for men too I said because because I envision a world where a man can can stay home and take care of the kids or who can take a career break, it can, can change careers, yes. who doesn't have the pressure to support the family, to be the one that never cries, to be the one that's just the, the you know, the steady ship in the night. And I said, actually, I'm, I'm a pro proponent for men just as much as women uh, in, in my mm -hmm. fight for equality so that yeah. we all get freed. We're all freed sure. from these stupid um, rules that, that society has given us. And unfortunately, the patriarch system is, does not, not allow a wide variety of people to thrive. And it is just, I'm just done with it. I'm done with it on behalf of men, certainly on behalf of women, mm -hmm. um, on behalf of everybody else that is, is, is part of this human experiment, right? And whatever, whatever sure. journey that you're on. And I even bought him a book, which he hasn't read yet, but I'll have to push him on that called, um, the mask of masculine <laughs> masculinity. I don't know if you've heard about that. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read that. No. It's the mask of masculinity. It's another podcast. Um, funny enough, I actually listen to a lot of podcasts by men. I need to probably diversify a bit, but, uh, Lewis, Lewis Howes, he's, <laughs> he was, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's another big podcaster and he was, um, you know, kind of a, a bullied as a kid just, just, he wanted to be really good at sports and went into professional football and then got injured and he was homeless, not homeless, but he was on his sister's couch, had no money, just 30 years old, just, just really kind of down and out. And he, he had been also abused as a, as a, as a young boy and carried a lot of shame with that. Anyways, he, he went into kind of a, also a self journey and, and, um, went into, um, yeah, interviewing people on podcasts, talking about, um, how to live a better life, right? How to live a more authentic life. And he wrote this book. And, and actually, I think I'd like to read it too, because it's just about how we don't let boys cry, how we say, suck it up. And he said that to my son the other day. I was like, suck it up. I said, but not because you're a boy, just suck it up because we're 20 kilometers into, because <laughs> we're 20 kilometers into this bike ride and it's closer to finish than to turn around and go back, you know? But I remember saying, suck it up to him. And I immediately I was like, but it's not because you're a boy. It's not because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you looked at me like, oh my God, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, that's, I know I went a little bit on a, on a tirade there, but. No, well, that's, that's great. And you're absolutely right. And I will read that book. That sounds good. And again, in terms of this experience, I mean, certainly patriarchy is really harmful and toxic to many men, especially uh, men who are, um, you know, uh, and, uh, people of color, um, you know, and but but all men it affects, and you know, I've obviously changed dramatically visually, and so now I've I've gone. For, I used to be gendered she her all the time wherever I went with the long blonde hair, of course. Now I get gendered sir and dude and bro and all of that stuff, <laughs> and so I've got to experience some of privilege, some of the privilege that comes yeah. with oh, that. You know, definitely people yeah. listen to me more and show me more respect and all of that. Oh, you know, so wow, I've got to experience some of that, God. but I've also got to see how much colder the world is when you're perceived as male and also how many men out there are looking for a fight and are looking to test who's the top man yeah that happens a lot 
Wow. I've been homophobically, homophobically abused as a gay man a couple of times. Um, I, but certainly I've had two or three experiences where, where guys have tried to pick a fight with me. You know, they've, they've literally been aggressive towards me to the point of wanting to see if I will, you know, man up and get in, get yeah. into the fray with them. Wow. Um, so That's so the, world is a very, mm, the world is a very, very different place when you're, you're perceived as male. And I miss um, the things I miss about being perceived as female. I miss the gentleness. I miss the, uh, mm. you know, as a woman, you do get, I mean, I know it's kind of, um, you know, outdated uh, and, and also it's a lot less than it used to be. But, you know, you don't get some of the niceties that you get as a woman. And mm. certainly people speak to me in a more aggressive, harder way now mm. than they used to speak to me as a woman. And I miss that kind of courteousness and that gentleness that you wow. receive more as a woman. That's amazing. I feel like there's a really great book in that. And I, I mean, honestly, you are sitting at such an interesting intersection of experiences. I mean, actually, that's fascinating. Funny you should say that, Shannon. I am, <laughs> as we speak, writing the book treatment for The Alchemy of Authenticity, Turning Your Shit Into Gold. So uh, I, I read that, but I didn't know what it was going to be about. Is it kind of in this, is it, it kind of it, along the topic, this topic? Yes. I mean, it's basically a combination of my memoir, um, but also the life lessons that I've learnt through my experience growing up as an intersex person with mental health challenges and, you know, being a creative person, changing countries, uh, changing genders, you know, it's the search for authenticity and uh, all of the lessons that I've learned through going on that church, that's that church, that search. You know? <laughs> and and for, for me also, the other part of my story around when, so after my second divorce, and I know that divorce is a subject that interests you, my second, my second divorce, you know, I had to really look at my part in that. Uh, and I had a big part in that. Um, part, but part of what I had to uh, part of what I was responsible for was the fact that because I wasn't living authentically as myself, mm. um, I was attracting somebody who was attracted to the, mm. the the thing that I was projecting to the world, which wasn't true, mm -hmm. uh, to, a, to a lie. You know, Sarah was a lie in many ways. I'd mm. been living so clean sober for many years and I thought I was being authentic but I really wasn't yeah and I which is why my depression was still part of my mm. life you know my depression would keep coming back mm. um and um my ex-wife was an incredible person in so many ways she really kicked my ass uh in in emotionally in lots of ways and made me work through my codependency and mm. made me really get in touch with my power and find my feet in the world again amazing um, but then when the and we worked really, we did so much. We were both really committed to the healing journey. We did lots of couples therapy. We did a retreat at a wonderful place called Onsite uh, near Nashville. And we did a couple mm. week couples retreat. We did this, you know, cause we're both people who've got huge childhood trauma and we, mm. part of our attraction was childhood trauma on trauma bonding. So we both really were, and we both loved and respected each other enormously and wanted it to work. So yeah. put that effort in. Um, so when we finally got to a place you know, where, you know, I'm, I, she'd come to live in England for two years because I was on the advisory council on misuse of drugs. And that was important. I stayed there and did yeah. that. She, she thought she's an American. She thought she was going to be fine in England. But yeah. It rained every day from the October to the January, by which point she was tearing her hair out. Um, so uh, I find that's why I moved to Los Angeles was to try and save my marriage. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we worked again on, on trying to do that while I was here and got my green card. And, you know, I, I committed to being here. Um, I, at first, I didn't particularly want to live here because I felt felt like my career and everything was yeah. based in Europe. But anyway, um, <laughs> so I went through all of those lessons. Um, and then um, ultimately the relationship failed and we I found myself getting divorced, divorce number two. And that brought up huge feelings mm. of failure and yeah. all of that stuff. Um, and I can't remember where I'm going with this point. What was the question, Shannon? Sorry, um, we were... Um, I was so enthralled in your story that I also lost track of it. Um, well, probably to do with um, kind of. You were oh, I know where I've, I've got to. it. I've got oh, okay, it. good, good, good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, <laughs> I was gonna... in, in the, so it, was a, it created this perfect storm of getting divorced again. Everybody who's ever got yeah. divorced knows how painful and awful that is, yeah. and the feelings of, that can come up around that, especially if you feel like you're culpable and the shame. You know, you were talking. Yeah. You, I didn't address the shame point. The shame was great. Um, and uh, so um, I went into this complete downward spiral and my mental health was failing as well because I was physically rejecting the estrogen. Yeah. Uh, I was looking awful, et cetera, et cetera. I, was, I spent far too long in my bed hiding, you know, uh, 
doing all the stuff that's the complete opposite of recovery, you know, hiding under the duvet, eating a lot of sugar, yeah. not looking after myself, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing I was doing was I kept going to recovery meetings, which thank goodness I did Good. that. Yeah. God, I've got the dog as well. Cause the dog yeah. was making me mm. take him for a walk twice oh, a day. Yes, 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 yes. So that was very healing. Yeah. But I basically got to a really suicidal place and I mm. was in a really suicidal place for a long, you know, quite a few weeks, if not months. Yeah. Um, and because I got so to the point of literally writing the letters to my family, oh my uh, gosh. I went back to England and I gave away most of my property. Oh, shit. Uh, you yeah. know, it, got, it got to that, that closeness of suicide. But because I got there and then t- got the outside help from a new therapist, went, um, decided to go on antidepressants, uh, and they did really help at that point. Um, and then really threw myself into Kundalini yoga. I became a, ah. I did a Kundalini, Kundalini yoga teacher training course, which was incredible in terms of shifting things that I had not been able to shift before. So I came out of that black hole and became seven and recommitted to mm. life. And, and I'm really glad that I went into that black hole for such a long time because it kind of has completely liberated me now. Um, and it's really helped me see what I want to do with the rest of my life. And now I'm 100% committed to living my life for however long that will be. I'm really grateful to mm. be alive still. And absolutely, I've got a fire un- under my butt to make sure that we stop intersex surgery uh, and that yeah. we tell stories so that as many people as possible can rise up. The United Nations actually condemned the treatment of intersex babies and children as torture. Yeah, um, I they mean, they use that word torture. It is. Um, and I know that when we find the right people, people will get it. People like yourself will get it and yeah. will engage. Yeah. And that in, in 20 years time, we will look back on this period of time and think, what on earth were we I thinking? Know. I know. How did that happen? I know. But we just need to reach that tipping point of awareness and consciousness raising, you know? Humanity, it's, uh, we're also impatient. When you know there's an injustice, when you, when you, inter- when you really say, this is an injustice and I'm going to fight against it, then, th- then you, you, you're so impatient for change, right? And, and, and we look back and honestly, I think, God, we've made such technological advancements. We, we're sending oh, people to the moon, yet on a personal level, we are just very, barely past Neanderthals. And uh, on a, on a, you yes, know, on the inner yeah. peace side of things. That, <laughs> yes. And, and what you said, it resonated so strongly with me because, um, the, there was a quote I came across that said, sometimes the thing that, that, that breaks your heart the most is the very thing you need to heal. And it's so true. And, and it goes with what Brene Brown says. Also, I'm, I'm, I've got a mad girl crush at the moment on Glennon Doyle for her book, Untamed. I mean, I just... Oh, I haven't read that. I, oh my God, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, really? and you will love her story. You, I'm not even going to go into it now because I want all my time mm-hmm. to be spent with you. But it's a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic story. But um, okay. the the whole idea behind the over-medication of America and other countries as well, mm. but America is one of the richest countries. And I tell this to my children. I'm like, poor people don't commit suicide. Like they're too busy trying to live and get through every day. And we, we have such a, uh, this, this where we, we want to fix everything with medicine or, or uh, shopping or drugs or whatever. And, and the best thing that we can do sometimes is just, just feel the pain and go through those dark moments because then there's often such, uh, such glory on the other side because then we're sort of, and actually I have it, I have it in one of my, I've got so many questions here for you, but I, I wanted to say to you, I see I have one, one point here, what doors were shut only to actually serve you because you had to create a new path. And maybe it's not that a door was shut, but I mean, maybe you could look at that with your marriage, right? You didn't, Mm -hmm. you wanted to fight to save it. But as you said, you were two trauma people who needed each other at a certain point, but trauma on top of trauma may not actually be that you were compatible when, even once you dealt with your trauma and, um, so anyway, well, I just I, 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 I'm really happy that my marriage broke up now because yeah. I've been on such an incredible journey and become seven. But also uh, an, another thing that happened was that my very good friend, Keith Collins, who was Derek Jarman, the filmmaker, writer and artist partner when Derek was alive. Keith um, died um, about. 18 months ago from a brain tumor very suddenly Keith was one of the smartest people I've ever met Mm -hmm. incredible guy uh, super smart had worked for the British government in intelligence had been a film editor uh, spent the last years of his life driving a tube train in London because he wanted to serve humanity Mm -hmm. Um, a real renaissance guy um, beautiful 
uh, and died of a brain tumor in a matter of months. And his death um, was another thing that made me really look at my life <clears throat> and think I'm, I'm 50 years old. Um, you know, there's so many things that I haven't done that I've just assumed I'm going to do at some point because, yeah. you know, I'll get around to it. Well, maybe I haven't got time to get around to it. And yeah. one of the things I realized coming out of my marriage was as a sexual being, um, there was loads of, I, I basically, I wrote a fuck it list. You know, we have a bucket list of, well, I wrote a fuck it list of all the things which I hadn't done I like sexually, that. which I, I oh. assumed that I would have done. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's <laughs> so, quite a list, I'm like, guessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a huge list when I started. Um, and oh, uh, when you started, that was subtle. When I started, <laughs> that was a yeah. huge list when it started. So yeah, you made I still your, got quite a, you made your I've way made through that progress. list. <laughs> I've made good progress. So part of my book is very Jackie Collins. I've oh got God, I've got the tw- I've got the 20, 20, 20, 20, 21 version of what what Hollywood is like. Um, but yeah, I've been on this amazing journey um you know and i learned so much about myself as a sexual being as an emotional being um i've i've really grown into myself i've worked through a lot of my insecurities uh i now feel very powerfully in myself as a sexual being um i'm very confident and uh, and and i think all of that is really interesting to other people i think many people have issues around their sexuality yeah uh, many people have insecurities in the bedroom or, uh, you know, on the boat or wherever you happen to be playing. <laughs> and um, I've been on a journey that's helped me work through those. And I think other people are going to like hearing about that. Cool. I know they are. Do you think that humans are meant to be monogamous? I think monogamy w- really works for some people. And I think certainly when you're raising children, monogamy creates a safe uh, container that that children thrive in um, and if it works for you and if it works for your partner that's wonderful I uh, am happily non-monogamous at the moment happily poly um, and as the current buzzword is okay uh, many many people are becoming poly right now and I think okay. that's I think that's great I think that I, th- I, I think one of the things one of the ways that I'm interesting is I tend to take the middle path or look for the middle path mm-hmm. and um, I think that for some people being poly is an avoidance of intimacy mm-hmm. um, and I would never say never again like I've been married twice I say I've got one more marriage in me mm-hmm. uh, but if I ever get married again that's it that's it <laughs> that's, that's it that's the one that's forever it. That's the uh, one. I do I do still ha- I do still believe in romance and I do yeah. still absolutely believe in love. Yeah. Um, and I know that to truly and deeply love, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, you know that, is, that can take a lot of time and energy for one person. So yeah. whether it's truly possible to love in a deep way more than one person, um, I don't know. I haven't had that experience. I know, I know people who have had that experience and who are living that experience. And yeah. they must have really big hearts and, um, you know, a very big bed and good for them. <laughs> <laughs> a very big bed. I like that. Okay. Um, let's talk about River Gallo's film that you are a producer on, um, yes. Pony Boy. For, 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 I'm going to gently correct you just because oh, good. Okay. Um, that's okay. I called, I called them River, Ga- River Gallo for quite a while before they corrected me. Oh, I've um, mispronounced it. Um, they're from El Salvador and they pronounce it Gallo. So oh, River Gallo. Gallo. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Uh, River Gallo. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, Pony Boy. I watched that and was just uh, moved, uh, to say the least. Um, and uh, also couldn't help but um, see Amy Winehouse. I, I mean, I, I, mm. there was a str- I mean, that, that may not be, that may just be the, an accident, that just, but there was something very. Amy Winehouse about um River's got an amazing look yeah yeah and, and there there is definitely an element of of Amy they definitely channel channel a little bit of Amy in their in their yeah. look and their being yeah actually. there are there are similarities in their per- not, not in terms of the kind of um uh behavior we've talked about already but in terms of um both super smart very tapped in people yeah, yeah. so how did that journey start how did you just, I mean, you've got, you've had the BBC experience, you've had mm-hmm. um, stand up comedy, so it's not a big jump that you would go into uh, producing. Um, but well, you, you would say that, that but it, it, it felt it, it it was really interesting because at the point that I met River, so so far, rewind, I was the I was 
I, so I became the world's first intersex stand-up comedian by accident. Every year <laughs> in my recovery, I do a challenge yeah. to expand my universe and to build my skills base and to just push myself. In 2014, I did skydiving. I don't like small oh. planes. Oh. I don't like parachutes. Oh. I don't like being attached to a large man who call, who looks like a Shrek. Um, but anyway, I did skydiving. Although maybe if he is underneath you and you fall, he's going to... Yes, spin him around. So there, maybe there's an advantage to that. <laughs> yes. Lovely man called Bernie, but okay. um, yes, we survived it. I was nearly sick on him, but we survived it. Oh. Um, so in, in 2015, I was like, well, what on earth can I do that's more scary than skydiving? And the only thing I could think of was stand-up comedy. So I did a stand-up comedy course that culminated in a live performance. I was awful through the course. I showed no discernible talent. I hadn't even done any drama since I was a you know, child. <laughs> but on the night, something happened and I just came alive and I was, I watched the video yesterday for the first time in the last time, uh, in a long time, and I killed it. This first performance, uh, I killed uh, it. Uh. And, and the tutor came up to me afterwards and said, I, you've got the thing that I can't teach. I've been teaching for 15 years. Wow. You have to become a stand-up comedian. And I was oh, like, yeah, 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 that's very nice. I'm a highly paid addiction therapist, addiction <laughs> mental health professional. I'm not gonna go and spend the next five years in dodgy pubs late at night doing open mics so I can become a stand-up comedian. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice. That's yeah. the last time I'm ever doing this. Yeah. Fast forward, I moved to Los Angeles. I haven't got a green card. I'm, I'm not able to work officially. I'm having a kind of mental and physical breakdown. So I think I need to step away from addiction. I'm getting bored. And I think, oh, maybe I will go to some open mics just to see. And maybe I'll do an acting course just for a laugh. So I went out and I started doing stand-up comedy in open mics. Anyway, I, I got to the stage where I actually was getting pretty funny and I got booked <laughs> to do the comedy store. So I became the world's first intersex comedian to perform oh at the God. Hallowed Comedy Store in Los Angeles, where all of the greats have performed, of course. Amazing. And the first night I'm in the green room, I am literally green and shit shitting myself yourself. Because <laughs> Because I like literally because I know I'm about to go on stage to talk about the size of my clitoris oh my in, God. Front of a main, in front of a mainstream audience telling jokes I've never told to anybody apart from other stand-up comedians oh who God. never really pay attention and don't laugh, especially if it's a good joke, they will never laugh. But oh. I didn't know if this material was even funny. Oh God. And anyway, I meet this lovely young comedian called Bailey and she's, I, I'm, I basically go, blah, 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 blah. I'm so scared, blah, 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 blah. my clitoris, blah, 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 blah. And she, she goes, <laughs> she comes me then and she, and she says this is so interesting i'd never met an intersex person before but i literally met another intersex person at a party two weeks ago called river gallo i must <gasps> introduce you <gasps> so after this <gasps> night Funny. which goes really well she introduces me to River. We chat on Instagram for a while. We finally go out to lunch, like literally months later, we finally go out to lunch. River walks in the room and I know immediately they're going to be a star. You know, I worked in, I worked in the, uh, the media business long enough that yeah. I've met, you know, I've, yeah. met, I've yeah. met all the people I ever wanted there to There was something. No. River has that thing that just some very, very few people have where they yeah. walked in the restaurant and everybody turned around and looked at them because wow. they could feel the energy. Yeah, yeah. cool. So River and, I, River and I have this lunch. River's an amazing person. We had a real intellectual connection. Funny, sweet, gorgeous. Uh, tells me that they've written this film called Pony Boy. They're a USC um, master's film student. They've written their master's thesis film called Pony Boy. Will wow. I have a look at it? Wow. So I said, of course I'll have a look at it. And I read it and the, the character is intersex, but it's like not a big deal because River is so young that they assume that the intersex stories have been told in yeah. film. Wow. So I, I say to River, do you realize this will be the world's first intersex movie? And they were astounded and couldn't believe it. So that was the first thing. And then I happened to be booked the following week to be doing a live discussion with Stephen Fry, God, <laughs> dad as we now call him. He just, <laughs> he book, he just read a book called Mythos about the Greek myths. And there was a chapter about the intersex deities in Greece because in, in, in ancient Greece, they worshiped intersex deities like Hermaphrodite. Yeah. So I'm booked to do this discussion with Stephen Fry via the Royal College of Art in London on <sighs> Skype. Stephen's in the Hollywood Hills. I'm in West Hollywood. So I say to them, can I bring this amazing young intersex person called River Gaia along? They say, absolutely. So River and I sat here like this, talking to Stephen, talking to the Royal College of Art. We all get on really well. The discussion's wonderful. Stephen afterwards says, please connect uh, River and Seven with me. I'd love to meet them. Wow. The next week, River, Charlie Clack and Joseph, who's Pony Boy's co-director, and I are with Stephen Fry in the Beechwood Cafe in the Hollywood Hills having lunch with 
dad now and <laughs> he's amazing oh, he, we tell him about the script well we sent him the script to the answer, in the answer to the meeting he read it he loved it we gave him the business proposal and the deck and the financial breakdown for the budget which is about seventy thousand dollars and he could see just how professional these young people are i mean they really mm. are off yeah. the scale uh, and so we ask him if he will help us if he'll be, in, be a producer at that meeting he signed on to be executive producer and wrote mm. us a check for ten thousand oh, dollars amazing but then i know which is like oh god it still wants to be cry now yeah that, to have somebody of that stature believe in the project and be willing Absolutely. to i mean you know that that's going to carry some, yeah, some big so weight. weight yeah but then that night he writes to all of his friends and says to them how amazing this project is and how important historically it is to film yeah. and how wonderful both River and Sade is an incredible young black woman who's been tipped by the Directors Guild of America as one to watch. Um, so he was very impressed with both of them. Uh, so he writes and says, please, will other people support this? The next morning, two people write back straight away. One, St Stephen's agent, who sent us $500. The other... Oscar Wilde Thompson, she wrote back the most beautiful email and said, please tell them that I want to support this film. I'll be a producer. Here's $5,000. They can use mm -hmm. my name in any way that will be helpful to the project. Wow. So suddenly this USC Masters film has Stephen Fry and Oscar winner Emma Thompson attached and me producing my first movie. <laughs> Guys, and we're off to the races. Astounding. And and they went out and they made, they made this film for $70,000. And when you look at it, it's incredible how beautiful it is for that money. It's an original soundtrack. It's stunning to look at. The, act, the quality of the actors that we have, all incredible. The um, music? It, the music is awesome. The music is so beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's all original, composed by Shade's boyfriend and another amazing wow, wow. and talented young um, uh, musician called Davy Boy. Uh, Eden Frey from Booty did the, most of the music for the soundtrack. Um, anyway, the film, I'm not just kind of, you know, speaking hyperbole. The film got into Becca Film Festival. It's been into 30 festivals around the world, including the BFI in London, major wow. festival in Sydney. Uh, it's been all over the world and audiences loved it. We won audience awards. Um, it's now available to watch on YouTube. We just put it on YouTube, the short. Um, yep. So for Pride Month, we put it on YouTube. Uh, and that is the world's first intersex Hollywood movie. But it's a short, it's 19 yep. minutes long. And we now, River in the last uh, year has written the feature script oh. and it's incredible. It's like, and I think this film can be a major success because it's oh like The God. Sopranos. It's totally. set in New Jersey, it's got lots of gangsters. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like The Sopranos mixed with Euphoria, the HBO series, which did brilliantly with young people. I don't um, know that one, I'll have to check it oh, out. Oh, it's wonderful, okay. really, really good. Okay. Um, it's, it's a very funny, um, moving, incredibly moving. It's it's kind of like um, Homer's Odyssey is the is the kind of oh. um, kind of basis of it's all set in one day. River uh, Pony Boy's journey um, back back home to basically heal their relationship with their father. Yeah. Um, but the trials and tribulations getting through New Jersey in this one day in the midst of a snowstorm on Valentine's Day is oh. really good. Wow, we I can't make... wait. Oh my gosh. Well, we'll connect offline. And I mean, I, I, I don't have my, my LA network is, is not what it used to be. But if there's any way, I, th there's a few people I could probably send, send you know, some Thank emails, you. emails the, too. The, the thing that we, as exec, putting my executive producer hat on, yeah. we, need, we need to raise $2 million, which okay. in film is paltry. You know, yes. that's a tiny, tiny budget in film. I think with uh, the quality of this script and the, Stephen's already signed up to be in the movie, he's going to take an acting role. Oh, he's God, he's a great huge. actor. He played Oscar Wilde with Jude Law. I, I know, so, he's Oscar yeah, Wilde. So oh my God, he's a, yeah. yeah. He's a great actor, so he's going to be in it. We're sure we're going to attract, although River obviously is an unknown star, um, they are the glad rising star and you know they've got the they've got the chops for the acting um but there's going to be other roles cast around river that people will really know their names and you know will, will want to see those actors um so for two million that's not very much of an investment and i think this 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 film will win awards it's going to be the world's first intersex feature yeah it's a very 2021 story yes um, and uh, I think anybody who decides to be involved in this project will not only make their money back, but could potentially make a lot of money 
and get to go to some very nice award ceremonies. So I love this. That's my plug over. I said, no, that's fantastic. (laughs) And and I was going to lead you into that anyway and and see how we, the audience, myself can help you. Um, But before, before we, we, we just talk about that from a financial perspective, because actually I'd Mm. consider that an alternative investment, which is, which, which for the right people with the right liquidity and kind of ability to just say, okay, I'm going to put some money here. It's not money I need to live off of. These are, these, these can be very cool investments. Absolutely. But yeah. um, maybe I can submit my CV to you because I made one hell of a, or my, yeah, my CV because I made hel- one hell of a, uh, of an extra on 90210, the original. Oh, for really? About, did you? For about three years. <laughs> did you? So I have tons of uh, experience acting as a, um, a student with no lines. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so if you ever Sharon, need a, an ex-banker. We can work something <laughs> out. We can work something out, believe me. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's so funny. I was, I was, I was, um, there's a, there's a party trying to find a way I, to work that in there somehow. <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a very good, very cool party scene that I can see you in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, that was so fun. I love it. And, and I actually forget that I did that ages ago and it was such a lark and I had no, no no plans to be an actress, but uh, uh, you know, a casting company had come to Pepperdine looking for just students, right? And I just, I guess, I just look like enough like a, a high school student. You know, I was in university, and uh, and I th- it was the hottest show on the planet at the time. And I thought, yeah. oh, Jesus, why the hell wouldn't I just at least try and submit in my picture? And and um, I got called in for the Halloween episode, and, yeah. and then I arranged my classes that they they filmed on Friday, so they they did all their rehearsing Monday to Thursday. And so then on Fridays, I could just go over. It was always offsite. It wasn't every <laughs> single episode, but it was fantastic. It was such a great experience. I like guess something funny to look back upon. So yeah, so I have mm. really, really good um, background in, in being an extra. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Anyway, okay. We have just taken up so much time. Um, I have a couple um, rapid fire questions for you. Before, before we oh, do, yeah. I'd, love to, be, I'd yes. love to end on your rapid fire questions, but before we do that, can we just yeah. go back to circumcision? Because we, you brought <gasps> oh, up circumcision yeah. and I didn't yeah. get a chance to, to talk about that. Yeah. Circumcision is a really interesting one because, um, yes, it is. Um, it is genital surgery. Yes, it does have an impact, be it consciously or unconsciously. There are obviously communities of people that have faith based reasons why that yeah. is part of their culture, and that obviously is a huge discussion and really presses buttons for people in terms of respecting their culture and their faith yeah however, those people aside yeah um, and we haven 't got time to discuss the kind of ethics of that those yeah. people aside the vast majority of babies who are having circumcisions in America, especially yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's no faith. There's no faith no. reason for it at all. Totally. Why it's happening is because doctors get to make some extra money out of doing it. <sighs> and, um, you know, it, there's a fantastic documentary actually on Netflix about circumcision, which looks at why it is that American, <sighs> the American medical system became a kind of default setting. Let's give males circumcision. And, um, it's really tied in with Christian puritanism actually, and boys, touching their playing with their peepees too much when they're little if they've got a foreskin to play with um and this film also looks at the evidence around you know physical health sexual health all of that stuff and debunks some of those myths and they are myths around um around um you know what the foreskin does or doesn't do and also speaks to many men who do feel like they've been scarred by having their foreskins taken away um you know so i you know i want to park the kind of religious aspect um you know but at the same time i would ask everybody who is thinking about having a male having a child yeah. maybe a male child or you're not in control of that most, yeah yeah, most yeah that's, that's true please do watch that documentary yeah. and just go into that birthing process with an informed mind because the the push is to just do the surgery that's the normal yeah and i would say that that normal is not good for yeah. most children i agree with you and i um and I was in that default setting um, years ago before I had children and a friend of mine had children earlier than I did. And she said, oh, I think we're not going to circumcise our son. And I was kind of like, what? You know, that's weird. And then she, and this was years ago. Uh, yeah, probably 15, no, no, maybe 19, 20 years ago. Um, and she was telling me some of that stuff. She's, and she said, you know, they actually did it because it desensitized boys and it was, they didn't want them to, yeah, get aroused or, or whatever. And I just thought, Jesus, I, you know, again, it's just ignorance, right? You just, you just go along with the status quo and you don't question it. And um, yeah, that's what, that's what we're here to do now because it's not, I think 
it is something that is shouldn't be done automatically for sure. And um, mm. I will put that in the show notes. I'll put the Netflix a link to that. Mm. Oh, that'd and, be great. Yeah, and so great. people can kind of go, you know, everything we've talked about, I'll go back and I'll do notes and links and oh, everything like you, that Shane. to the YouTube video um, and to, you know, all, all the things that we've, we've, we've looked at and make sure that there's, um, you know, people you. have I'd, an access. I'd love people to read my alchemy of authenticity article just because yes. you know, many of us are going back into lockdown with COVID-19 and many people are struggling with mental health challenges as, you know, as a result of the kind of stress and anxiety. And this article has got lots of tools in it that people can take away things that they can do to help get through this without having to hit the alcohol and hit the ice cream. Good. Well, I think that will be very valuable and we'll definitely make sure that that gets shared, uh, not only on the website with the links, but also, you know, social media and all that sort of thing. Uh, so that's, that's the least we can do. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. So a little, a little, little fire questions. Okay. Oh my goodness. You ready? Need, wake I'm, up. Do you need another so. quick, do you need an espresso? No, they're not too bad. They're not too bad. <laughs> they're not, I'm, I'm just playing around with format a little bit. Okay. okay. What's the one book you've most gifted or recommended to people? Uh, the Artist Way by Julia Cameron. Okay. Oh, you got, you're ready for that you one. You know it? No. I think I've heard Wonderful. of it, but I've, I've definitely never read it. It's a book. Julia Cameron is in recovery many, many years. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of um, recovery understanding in it. So it's very good for anybody uh, who's sober. But it's also a book that anybody who feels frustrated in terms of that you're not accessing your creativity, you're mm. not um, fulfilling your potential, maybe you feel stuck in your job and that you're not doing the right thing that you should be doing. This book has the tools to help you discover your creative self and it's transformative. Wow. It's, I've given it to you know creatives who are really accomplished and it's up their game okay. and i've also recommended it to people who are completely stuck and it's unblocked writers painters oh. artists cooks whatever area you know whatever your creativity is it will help you find it it's cool awesome see this is this is a huge value to people out there what's the best investment you've ever made it could be time money energy in your life health, health. By far. That's, i've spent i've spent Probably somewhere between one hundred and twenty-five and one hundred fifty thousand dollars on my healing. Yeah, and it's by far the best investment. That's a good one. What purchase under a hundred dollars has most impacted your life in the last six to twelve months? Maybe it's your marks and stuff. <laughs> under a hundred dollars. We're giving them lots of <laughs> under a hundred dollars exactly. Oh my! Goodness. You were just like, oh, that that was just the best twenty bucks I've spent in a long time, or whatever it is, sixty. I went for my first mass massage the other day. That does it have to be a physical object? No, 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 anything. Oh, anything. I, I had I I I love having at least one massage a week. I think yeah. it's really important. Yeah. Especially if you're doing lots of exercises, I do. I hadn't had one through the whole Corona lockdown. Yeah. I went for one that was. I went initially just for a foot foot one, thinking they would just do feet, but the woman basically was a very tapped in, amazing uh, massage person, and she ended up giving me a full body massage. Wow. I walked out of there God, I'm floating. I felt oh, so nice. good. See, so and good. it's that's a worthwhile investment, isn't it? Yeah. If you were president, what would be your first order of business? <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> my first order of business. Mm. Oh my God. I wish I'd asked for these in advance. These I know. <laughs> Just throw something out there. Um, oh, actually it's easy. Uh, moratorium and all intersex surgery. That sounds like a good one. Nice. If you could create any new product, anything, what would it be? Could be fantasy products. Could be, you know, it doesn't have to be that it's scientifically viable, but that would a make your life that, better. A, a mirror that helps you see your true self. Oh, I like that. Very um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Mm. What's the one thing that you've never been asked but wish you had been? Oh my God, these <laughs> questions are so deep. How could you do this to me? <laughs> I've had people skip that one, so don't worry about it. Maybe there's something about you. Maybe you get, I, I was conscious to think, you know, you probably don't want to talk intersex your whole life. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's other things about you that are, maybe somebody hasn't asked you. Mm. Do you want me to go on to the next one? Go on to the next one. I need to think about that. Okay. The one question you've never been asked. Yeah, that you wish you would have been. Oh, okay. 
uh, oh, I have been asked it subsequently. <laughs> well, that's okay. Um, we can cheat a little. Um, <laughs> well, as a child, I wish I'd been asked, who are you? Ah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. And I, I, wish, I wish everybody would ask their child who they are rather than telling them who they are. Ah, that's powerful. I, I think in so many ways we decide who other people, and also in relationships, we decide who somebody else is mm. or who we, who we need them to be for us. Mm-hmm. And so I think just checking in saying, you know, who are you? Who would you like to be? Wow. Rather than deciding we know for another person. I love that. That's very powerful. That's fantastic. And, tw- and twisting the rules though. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Um, no more questions, but is there anything else that you need in your life right now that you want to put out into the universe? It's in Malibu, near the beach. Okay. Well, can I, can I, can I, can I stay there when I come to town? <laughs> you absolutely can. You absolutely can. Any, anybody listening to this. <laughs> can come and stay. If they help you get yeah. your house in yeah. Malibu. It, it's, hap- it's happening. You know, I, li- I live in this, be- I call it the skate shack in West Hollywood. It's a lovely little place and I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. I do sleep in the closet so that I can have the bedroom as my writing slash th- uh, counseling room. So I am literally a queer person in the closet. Oh no! That's uh, in funny. that closet, that is awesome. And oh I can God. afford. I can afford to not live there. Like uh, right now, I could probably, yeah. you know, get maybe something a little bit bigger. But yeah. I've kind of made the decision that I want to go from living in the closet to living in the Malibu beach house. I don't want to do the middle. I want to. I want to go straight from that to that. Yeah, let's and not I, do the I, middle. Just go straight. Yeah, to let's, the Malibu beach. yeah. Just, just some people do the Hollywood Hills first. Yeah, you know, no. I'm, I'm Malibu beach Malibu. house is good. Yeah, but, but seriously though, these p- young people that I am privileged to work with, River and Shade, and a young producer called Kristen Lafey, they are so, so talented. And given where we're at with Hollywood and Me Too and everything, if yeah. these young people can't, you know, get the tools that they need and get the money they need to make films and, and achieve their success, you know, the, then, well, I know that, uh, let's not put it that way, that's a negative way of putting it. These young people are going to get the money they need to make yeah. the films they're capable of and the television shows they're capable of. I am very lucky to be along for the ride at this stage in my career yeah. in supporting them. And of course, the Malibu house is coming. It's just, I hope it comes quickly. It may come quicker <laughs> than you think. You put it out into the universe. That's what you've got yeah. to put it out there, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm happy to house it. If somebody's got a Malibu that, that could be a that they're start. not using that most of the start. time, I'm very happy to sit it for you, keep it safe. And Are um, you listening, Malibu? Are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> um, so have you thought about crowdfunding at all? Is that too complicated? We, we, did, or? We, did, we, we did crowdfunding for the short. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, they had been crowdfunding before I met River. Yeah. And it's an incred- incredibly laborious process yeah. that raises a very small, small amount. amount of money. I yeah. mean, it was good for the feature. It did raise like 10% pro- perhaps for yeah. the feature. Yeah. Um, but, but when you're making a feature film, um, you really need, uh, yeah. I really need two or three investors. I think yeah. two or three yeah. investors uh, who get the project, who are possible. willing yeah convoluted yeah we need to keep it simple and we need to have good people who have faith and who have the resources and commitment to the project yeah so that we can all be part of the same team you know because i I see there being a pony boy too definitely because the whole story is in one day there's it's obvious that when pony boy resolves that part of the stony story there's a whole world that's possible for them so so there's definitely a sequel if not two sequels uh built into that and i also think it would be an amazing television show that i think the world of character the world of characters could create an incredible television show i am also really into computer games i think that computer games are a very important part of popular culture Mm -hmm. and i'm very keen to to be part of uh, creating computer games that uh, are not about shooting people and violence yeah. and death. Yeah. God, They're about yeah. problem solving. Yeah, and, and, yeah. You we know. could do with a few of those. Well, River Gallo is divine, and mm. um, I agree with you. I think the the potential there is huge. I mean, it kind of has a Netflix thing all over it, but I guess it does, one, of, yeah. one of the downsides with Netflix is that they they don't let you keep much of the um, right the rights and. Um, yeah, but I mean, it seems like something that they would be interested in. I yes, I'm trying. I'm trying to get in the door with the right person at Netflix. If there's anybody out there who can help with that, okay. Uh, also, obviously, Amazon Prime would be amazing yeah. too. Jeff, Jeff yeah. Bezos has really stood up through yeah. Black Lives Matter. Yeah, uh, he's he's really put uh, Amazon behind Black Lives Matter in a very powerful way. Has he? I um, didn't. I didn't. I wasn't aware that he'd make. Yeah, made it yeah. Good... He's, 
yeah he's done really he's I've done really that. well i've really i've really respected what he's done okay uh, through through this period do you think black lives matter has lifted will will lift all different types of communities yes i think yeah. it's 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 fundamentally going to change things and thank goodness you mm-hmm. know um obviously i work with river and Sade. Sade has been hugely affected by 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 you know george floyd's death and yeah. Breonna's death and as all people of color have been of course right. and we've been out on some of the some of the big demonstrations in los angeles and yeah. uh, i think you know as a white person uh, it's made me really commit to the educational process. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I thought I knew a reasonable amount, but I realized that there are vast areas that I'm ignorant about. Yeah. Um, and I know lots of, lots of white people are doing that and realizing that actually, you know, th- this is not okay. This has to change. You know, I've mm. been looking at the constitution of boards and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's really, we were talking about trans people and employment and I think yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. It's really important that employers really think about employing trans people yeah. and the challenges that trans people face to be themselves and realizing that as with people in recovery, a trans employee, if you treat them fairly and give them opportunities, yeah. they're going to, they're going to have so much loyalty to your yeah. company and they've got so much to give because totally. they've been through so much. Yeah. What, a, what a great person to have on your team. And totally. you know, getting back to Marks and Spencers, yeah. I wrote Marks and Spencers and said to them, look, I'm really pleased with the diversity of models that you've mm. got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's far, mm-hmm. more, far more black um, people and people of color on your website, but please, can you get some trans people? Please, can you get some non-binary people? Because yeah. you know your, your marketplace is shrinking. Your, your demographic is aging totally. and dying off. You, know, you make wonderful products. Why are you just selling to this small group Into of people? Into one, one box. You know, have something, all you've got to do is have a couple of, couple of trans, trans models on there and show your inclusivity. And suddenly, exactly. you, you know, you've got millions of people around the world who will love you. Yeah, no, 100%. I think that... Um, that- I, I, my, one of my more recent interviews was with a, uh, a snowboard, a female snowboarder who had to break a lot of glass ceilings, ice ceilings, mm. if you will, to, yeah. to be able to race, um, slopes that men would, could race. And they were told, mm-hmm. I mean, she's 35, I think 34. So I'm mm-hmm. she's not 70. And mm-hmm. she was told that it was too dangerous. And they were oh, always yes. put at the end of the, the day where the conditions were bad. And, yes, um, and, and, the, and, and she made a good point that, you know, if you look at the spending power, who's buying sports equipment, who's buying clothes, even for boys and men, it's oftentimes mm-hmm. the women. And so if you, you're not, they're not putting anywhere near that percentage into sponsoring women's events um, mm-hmm. as they do uh, for men's events, even though the mm-hmm. women are spending more than 50% of crazy. the money. And it's the same, it's the same concept, I believe, is that don't box yourself in with your, with your, um, with your marketing. And uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's um, God. I mean, we could just, we could talk so much more. I think we're just going to have to <laughs> to pick it up down the road, but I will, I will, um, in many ways, however I can help you, I will do that uh, above and beyond what we've already discussed and reach out to my network. Um, you know, I managed money for a long time and have a variety um, of connections there. Uh, it can't, you know, no promises, but I'm happy to, sure. to let certain people know that, that about this film and, um, you. you know, maybe That's we can true. drum up some support there any way we can. And um, on all the other topics we've, we've discussed, it's been such a pleasure and um, gosh, I, I really can't wait to see all the things that you're, you're going to go on to do and wish you the best of luck. And hopefully, you know, we can be in touch and uh, you know, we can, we can, I can champion you however, however best benefits you in the future. Shannon, it's been really lovely, lovely meeting you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, I can't wait to hear all the exciting things you're going to go on to do. And please keep me updated on your on your book and any other projects that you do. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll watch from afar from Switzerland and let you know next time I'm in California and uh, we'll go look at beach houses together. Yes. <laughs> Um, River's doing his uh, their, oh, yes. oh I did so well with their perceived pronouns a challenge I did really well oh, with their good. pronouns well, all the I way haven't... through 
I've been river, consciously yeah, like yeah. trying to do it. It's, it's a process. It river, is. River, river has their Disruptors Fellowship um, event tonight where they're going to be um, performing an extract from their television series coming soon yeah. in front of a kind of great and the good of the industry. I know it's a nightmare time for you guys in Europe. Yeah. It's because it's seven o'clock here, Pacific yeah. Standard Time. Yeah. Is there any possibility of you coming, do you think? Well, I, I, I did register for the tickets. I have to oh, check my did. email. Great. I did. And it, I think it's four o'clock in the morning, but what the hell? Yes. I can, I can get up and watch it. I'm going to do it. Um, it doesn't matter. I will do it. So yes, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to watch it. I just need to make sure I got the link. Um, I think it'll be Eventbrite or something like that. Is that yes. If you didn't, I can send it to you. Okay. I'll let you know. I'll have a look. And um, yes, that is super cool. Um, there's probably so much more I wanted to ask you that I'm going to kill myself over. But anyway, no. <laughs> we did. We, we did great. We covered a lot. I mean, this is the longest interview just, I've ever did. done. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, but it's been great. To you. I apologize. No, I love it. Oh, I love it. And I think that's the nice part about it is that uh, who knows? Maybe what I should do is split it in the first and second half. Make two podcasts out of it. That that might could mm -hmm. be an idea. That could be Why nice. Not? I could try that out. Let's see. Cool. Enjoy your day. Um, enjoy your, your lovely dog and your asshole cat, which I think you yes. said in, in one of the articles that I read. <laughs> the dark laird. He's a little bugger, but the we dark love him. Laird. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yes, we'll be in touch and uh, wishing you all the, all the best in the meantime. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Take care. Take care.